All right, it is 7 o'clock. I'd like to call to order this uh, January 29th, uh, 2024 meeting of the Waterbury Select Board. Uh, I'd like to first apologize for uh, having to change the venue. Uh, I'd like to also thank uh, Chief uh, Dillon for welcoming us to the firehouse so that we could accommodate uh, more people. Uh, about uh, a week ago, a little less than a week ago, we found out about uh, this new initiative uh, at the, for the use of the armory, which had previously been suggested to be used for housing. And uh, now, uh, with this new thing, we knew that it was going to attract a certain amount of uh, public interest. So we moved it to here. And I apologize for any inconvenience. <laughs> I'll try to speak louder then. Um, and I do appreciate the fact that you will respect uh, the fact that we'll have one person speaking at a time. Um, we do have a packed agenda. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, among other things, we need to pass the uh, proposed budget for 2024 uh, by the end of the evening. So we're going to try to stick with the agenda. That is the first uh, item on the agenda. Do I hear a motion? To make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Um, we, I would like to propose that we add an additional 10 minutes to the uh, 720 item, the National Guard building development, to make it a, a 50 minute item. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, now we're voting on the amended uh, agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, the agenda is approved as amended. Uh, we'll add 10 minutes to the discussion on the uh, National Guard building development. Second item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Um, do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda is approved as written in the agenda. Next item is the public session. Uh, this is for anything that's not on the warned agenda. Uh, the National Armory, use of the National Armory building is on the agenda. We'll be discussing that uh, in two more items. So we'll have plenty of time for that. But anyone that would like to address anything not on the ad warned agenda tonight, please come forward. I ask that you keep your remarks to three minutes or less. And we'll requ anything requiring more than that, we'll put it on in a subsequent meeting agenda. I should note that uh, on the people participating via Zoom, uh, we don't have the chat uh, function tonight. So you just have to uh, turn on your camera and raise your hand so I can recognize you. But I don't see anyone being asked to be recognized at this point. So we'll move on to the appointment of the Housing Task Force. Is Peter Hack here? Right here. Oh. All right. Peter. Peter, if you wouldn't mind coming forward, please. Sure. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, you can sit right over here, actually. We've got, uh, <laughs> we have a special <laughs> guest chair this evening. All right. Peter has applied for an appointment on the Housing Task Force. Uh, Peter, can you explain why you're interested in that position? Uh, well, I've been a landlord in town for 20 years. I've got a few units here and there. Um, I'm in the construction business my whole life. So I've got the background and I have the interest. Um, obviously housing is part of my, my life, but uh, I have an interest in, in helping out the town, helping out where I can. I think I have some, uh, I, I don't have any solutions obviously, but I hope I can uh, help the, uh, the process. All right. Thank you. Thank you for stepping forward. Any questions from the board? 
Done. Any question from the public? Do I have a motion? I move to appoint Peter Hack to the Housing Task Force. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Peter, welcome to the Housing Task Force. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming forward. We appreciate your service. Yeah. Somebody will be in touch, right? Yes. <laughs> Karen will be. <laughs> okay. Uh, next on the agenda is the National Guard uh, building development. Uh, we understand that uh, Chris Winters of uh, DCF is here. Chris, are you in the audience? Oh. He will be momentarily. Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to have uh, Skip come forward and present his agenda in the meantime? Could you move this podium, or is it there for? Uh, we we're going to use it for people that wanted to speak, but we can uh, and, side, but yeah, why don't we do that? Wait, where's where are we moving it? Uh, we'll just move it for the time being. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you juggle Car and Carla, why don't you phone announce phone? there's a sign-up sheet going around? <laughs> you could sign up just to document that you were here in the audience tonight. That'd be great. And legibly, please, so I can read it. <laughs> Roger. Okay. Roger. Gotcha. Uh, I move. Kane. I move to put Skip Skip's presentation above the National Guard building development portion of the agenda. I guess that's the whole motion. Fair enough. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Skip, uh, if you wouldn't mind coming forward and giving your presentation on uh, the Edward Farrar Utility District. Skip Flanders, for those that don't know, is the chair of our utility district. Has served in that capacity for several years. More than Skip would like to admit. I'm trying to find my note. <laughs> we'll say that uh, parking was so tough out here, I had to drive back home and park at home before I came tonight. So, uh, I apologized earlier. I'll to say <laughs> no problem. I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, uh, the church. Uh, what? Up in your top pocket up there, uh, inside. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank just you. Like well, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk to the select board tonight. I think um, that's good talking to the different boards and things that we appreciate the opportunity. Skip, um, I'm going to have to just ask you to project because we have a big crowd. Yes. Um, and one of the topics you mentioned was the Wallace Award that you and I have talked and I've talked to Rosina Wallace and um, we have some good candidates to receive the Wallace Award that we will be doing at town meeting this year that we forgot last year. So um, we'll be working on that. Um, incentives for housing. I'm also on the housing task force that Peter just uh, got a pointing to. And one of the things is uh, incentives for housing that we talked to some uh, contractors and things. And one of the things they mentioned is reducing fees and fees like the water and sewer allocations and things and permit fees. So if we're going to get into um, Incentives that reduce fees, we would need to coordinate with the select board on what we do on that. Also, one of the other options is uh, tax reductions <coughs> agreements going forward. That if they did housing, they might get a reduction in their property tax for five or ten years as an incentive to have housing and things. So that might be something um, you know that we would talk about there. Um, 
We're also uh, working on the um, employee appreciation breakfast, the uh, pancake breakfast that the uh, water commissioners <coughs> and the commissioners have done over the years. Um, last year, or when we did the retirement, the one before Bill's retirement, was kind of short notice, and I felt bad that Alyssa and Danny had worked on setting it up, but then had to go to work, which was uh, too bad they didn't get to uh, enjoy the discussions and things, and they wanted to do a better job this year. Also, one of the things, uh, the employee breakfast, I tried to include uh, the volunteer boards that do so much for Waterbury. And having them on a uh, weekday morning and things, a lot of them go to work, but I don't know if there's anything we can do about um, making a better arrangement that they could come. We talked about a Saturday breakfast, but then the town employees and <laughs> things might not want to come. So anyway, we'll um, have discussions with you about setting up a date. Okay. And you don't have any date in mind right now? No. Okay. Um, and things. Um, and then I was going to talk about the pro water project that the E5 commissioners are talking about coming from uh, a water line extension from Guptal Road over through and coming out to where Cabot Annex is. Um, that uh, the discussions began about trying to provide fire protection for all the property in that area, that there's a lot of development and needed fire hydrants and things for fire protection. But when Bill Woodruff talked to the people about uh, the water line and getting rights away to get over there, there's a lot of um, wells with poor water quality mm -hmm. that we could pick up. There's a mobile home park, the East Wind Mobile Home Park, that has uh, water quality problems in your well that we would be um, providing, uh, you know, water service to them, which you know, would be to their advantage. Um, you know, they're kind of in the affordable housing category too, so that's good. So um, we're in the design phase with that. It's fairly expensive. I think the last quote was four million dollars. Uh, three million, but that was a year ago, so four million is probably right. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've gotten some grant funds um, and things where we hope we don't have to raise rates in order to do this. Um, people have been concerned about possibly um, running the water line out there opens up areas for development. Um, everybody that we've <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, did we just lose somebody? Uh oh. <laughs> anyway, everybody we've talked to is already an existing building, and if you know much about Vermont, um, development is usually controlled by finding uh, room for uh, sewage disposal. You can drill a well in most places, so it's not likely to open up any areas. Um, that weren't um, available for development. Um, Wi-Fi's out. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for the interruption, Skip. Uh, we just lost a portion of our audience. Oh, maybe they're back. Oh, here we go. Recording in progress. There we go. All right. Um, we're also working with the PECs on the uh, Neal and Flats Mobile Home Park, um, getting a uh, grant and things to replace the uh, water line serving um, the park that they would be in the road and um, improve the old lines that are there, the original lines and things. And uh, once it's complete, the commissioners have agreed to take it over and operate and maintain that system when it's done. So uh, that further... You know, <coughs> when do you expect that to be done? Um, they're, try they're trying to get their permits now. I don't know if their money is lined up, but I would say within two years it's likely to be 
I don't know, maybe Tom has a further update. I think that sounds about right. Um, something for the select board to think about for that project too or for the Route 100 project is both those projects would entail adding fire hydrants. And the question has come up is that should that be a town expense because in essence we're protecting the town's grand list. So I think it's a reasonable conversation to have in the future when we get closer. Um, and I, quite can a few years ago, the, the audio and the mm -hmm. video went out for online. Can you just recap the last two minutes briefly? <laughs> sure. Um, Skip uh, Flanders, the chair of uh, the Edward Farrar Utility District, has been discussing the future programs that he's got lined up. Uh, or that the, the commission has lined up uh, to expand water services uh, mostly up uh, towards the Route 100 corridor and uh, some of the adjoining uh, trailer parks uh, that are uh, likely to be serviced, uh, including East Wind and uh, Neyland Flats. Um. Well, you got to the bottom of the list. Oh, that the PECs had paid with their own money to run a water line up uh, Neyland Flats Road into the park. So they had been getting water, um, you know, for three or four years um, through their own lines. Mm -hmm. So this is not a new connection, but an upgrade of their lines here. Um, we're also... Uh, concerned about the recreation things in the watershed area um, up on uh, Waterworks Road, uh, Loomis Hill there, that increasing use through uh, the trails and bike paths and protecting the, uh, the watershed and things. And we've worked with the uh, Department of Forest and Parks. They're doing the Worcester Range Management Plan, which includes you know, recreation and things that uh, we're submitting comments relative to that. And, you know, not sure what um, concern, controls and things we'd like to uh, implement, but um, we're concerned about that here and things. So, yeah. um, I think that concludes my comments and update relative to EFUD and things. I don't know if you folks have any questions for me at this time. Uh, I think I'm good, but uh, the rest of the board? Good. Yes, Danny. Is there any concern about like the feasibility or um, any hesitation about the uh, Route 100 project going through? I know you're only in the planning phase, the, but the new the, you mean the water line across? Water line, right. Does it just seems like you're just early in the phase, or is there concern about it <coughs> happening? Um, it's it's more than the early phase. We've done, we're in final design. Okay, okay. Excellent. Um, and some grant money. The only concern would be getting enough money to go forward with it, um, going out to bids at the rate materials and everything are climbing. Mm -hmm. um, it's a pretty significant project here to take on. Yeah. So. Other questions from the board? Any questions from the public? I couldn't hear the, the question. I'm sorry. Uh, Can you? Sure. I can answer that. So um, the initial engineering had about a $3 million price tag for the project. We have a grant for $600,000 from the state, and we have a federal earmark of $2.4 million. The federal earmark um, has passed a House Appropriations Subcommittee, but getting it through the full House and the Senate and signed, uh, who knows when that will occur, if that will occur. Um, and then the $3 million, the $3 million cost for the project is now a couple years old. So even if all those funds are secured, and I'm not, I'm not counting on the federal dollars coming anytime soon, 
there still could be a budget challenge. So that could be that um, if it's small enough, the rates, there could be a rate adder for users of that water line, for new users, and it wouldn't impact everyone. But uh, that really depends on the number of users who sign on and um, just the overall cost. Yes. So, Tom, that, that is under the purview of EFUD, correct? Correct. So it's, it's basically a user-based uh, uh, expenditure, and, and other than grant money and whatever else, it doesn't relate to people who don't use uh, town water. So it probably it's not a town issue, right? That's correct. Uh, correct. All right. Uh, Skip, thank I would just you. like to add while I'm here um, to thank the select board and uh, the public employees and the volunteers for all the help. Um, in the two <coughs> floods we went through in July and December living in the floodplain and uh, I mm -hmm. can appreciate all the help and think you uh, did an excellent job of uh, providing service and the volunteers that came around as well. So a big thank you from us for, for your efforts in that behalf. So, Thanks, uh, Thanks, Skip. Thank you, Skip. We appreciate your, thank you. your Thanks, work. Skip. If I could just make a note to everyone in the audience for having connectivity issues. If you're on our Wi-Fi, please shut it off, and maybe that will help things. I don't think they are. I'm on a secured network. Is there a way to increase capacity? People are texting me that there's no no, I can't. The plan that we have is is uh, the plan that we have. All right. So is uh, Chris Winters here to come back? Has he joined us? He has. Yeah, we're, we're All right, Chris, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Are we recording? Yeah, we wonder. <laughs> One second, and just make sure we're yeah. recording what we can before yeah. we get started. Sure. Good Good evening. Evening. We're going to just yeah. wait in the right spot. And <laughs> try to <laughs> get everything Kenny, give me my back in order. Back. <laughs> yeah. Would there be uh, uh, the ability to maybe bring the podium? Because I've heard some people back here saying they'd like to have him stand at the podium if he could, over maybe off to the side rather than the front so the people from Zoom can. Is that possible? Uh, actually, people are going to hear him uh, via Zoom. The closer oh, he is to it's the coming uh, through the loud. The, the Zoom not, is being heard from this computer. Right yeah, here. the yeah. microphone's yeah. in the yeah. computer, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll try to project our voices as we can move he, forward. Can you stand up, perhaps? Would that help a little bit? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have not, uh -huh. not the hot seat. I'm going to stand up. Hosting <laughs> gig. Uh, it's fine. I mean, the orca's on. While we yeah. still work through a couple of the issues here, uh, I'd like to welcome Chris and uh, thank you for coming to present. Uh, this will be the first time uh, any of us have had the opportunity to get some clarity on what is now being proposed. I think my understanding, uh, last I heard, was that the state was proposing to use the uh, National Guard facility uh, to sell it to a uh, developer for housing. And then uh, a little less than a week ago, we were informed that there was a new initiative, which has since been uh, posted uh, in various media. Uh, and I think that's the reason that you have uh, such a large audience here, is that uh, perhaps there's a perception that uh, this is being rushed uh, to uh, service, uh, and um, I just wanted to say I know that there are a lot of people here that would like to voice concerns. Uh, one of the things that we're uh, going to try to do is to, when a particular concern is voiced, I'm going to ask for a show of hands to see how many people share that concern. So we get a sense of who is what, and we won't have to have a lot of repetition. Uh, so. Um, you know, just by way of introduction, I'd like to say that uh, Waterbury has been a welcoming community uh, for over a century. 
this community in partnership with the state uh, welcomed people with mental challenges uh, from all over the state uh, and uh, to this day uh, I think we still have uh, carry a lot of compassion for those that are in unfortunate circumstances uh, um, and uh, at the same time I've been hearing a lot of concerns about whether this new proposed facility is going to be able to care for the served population adequately. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to raise their hand and has, shares that concern. I also have heard that uh, people are concerned about uh, the vitality of the Waterbury community and the, our host community. And I don't know how many people share that concern. Quite a few. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, our board, uh, starting with uh, Mike Bard, Kane Sweeney, Danny Kelman, Alyssa Johnson, our municipal manager, Tom Lights, and I'm Roger Clapp. One question for you. Are you related to uh, Phil Winters, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Ag Extension agent? I, I grew up in Williamstown. Mm -hmm. Phil's my great uncle. Uh huh. Okay. Well, my grandfather's brother. I very much enjoyed working with him when I served uh, at the Department of Agriculture. He had a great dry sense of humor, and we're yes. glad to have his great nephew here. Um, so, recording if you in progress. <laughs> we are now recording in progress. Um, for those that are on Zoom. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Karen. Karen. Oh, yes. Uh, Karen uh, Petrovich is uh, here as our town clerk and town treasurer. And Teresa Wood uh, is a Waterbury resident and a, our uh, representative to the legislature and serves as chair of the Human Services Committee. And thank you for coming and your participation. Uh, for those that didn't catch it on Zoom, we are going to try to get everyone heard from. If you wanted to turn on your uh, cameras and raise your hand when you agree with a particular concern, that'll show us a little bit of the flavor of people that are following this discussion today. At this point, I'll turn it over to Chris, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and uh, give us some detail as to what's being proposed. Sure. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Winters. I'm the commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. I'm a native of central Vermont growing up in Williamstown. Uh, my wife grew up here in Waterbury, very familiar with the community, and I want to echo a lot of the things that were just said uh, about the role that Waterbury has played in being a part of our state human services solutions. Um, what I'm talking about today is very fast moving. I want to apologize for not being able to come to the community sooner, but I am here tonight. I was going to do this on Zoom, but thought I'd best show up in person given the number of people who are interested in this topic today. I will say that in uh, probably all my years as a school board member in Berlin, this is about the total number of people who showed up to all five years' worth of meetings. Um, so I'd love to see community engagement. I do want to hear uh, what folks have to say. It'll inform our decision making. Um, and I also want to answer any questions that you have and hopefully alleviate concerns that you have. My hope is that you would support this project. Uh, coming out of the meeting tonight, but I'm sure you have a lot of questions, a lot of legitimate concerns already raised here. I thought I would give some background uh, to help you understand how we got to the decision-making point that we got to around the armory just in recent weeks um, and how fast-moving all of this is as we try to address our homelessness crisis in the state of Vermont. Uh, we have a housing crisis, first of all. I don't think that's a, a secret to anyone. Uh, our, our vacancy rates in Vermont are among the lowest in the nation. Our rents are among the most expensive in the nation. And you can see a direct correlation between this and the number of Vermonters who are experiencing <coughs> unsheltered homelessness right now. Um, it's expensive. There are low vacancy rates. And we're unable to address some of these issues without more housing units. We're ag aggressively pursuing policies, and you'll hear a lot about it in the legislature this year, to promote unit generation, but that's going to take time. And in the meantime, we have 1,600 households living in hotels and motels across the state. 
and that's households. It's more like 2,300, 2,400 individuals living in hotels and motels. That's expensive. It doesn't connect them to the services that they need. It doesn't move them into permanent housing. Uh, so we don't want to follow that model into the future. What we do want to do is expand our traditional shelter system where people can be connected to services. They can move on uh, to more permanent housing. Now, meanwhile, we're trying to address what we have in front of us while we're trying to address the long-term solution. And part of the shorter-term solution is standing up five additional temporary shelters in five communities across the state. And we know where the highest concentration of folks experiencing homelessness right now is in Bennington, Rattleboro, Rutland, Chittenden County, Washington County. So we're trying to stand up under the um, current proposed budget that we're working with. We're trying to stand up five shelters with as many beds as possible in those five <coughs> communities. We also have 500 um, of what we would call traditional shelter beds across the state. So those are the ones that are connected, uh, connected to services, uh, often provide meals. They uh, connect people with employment opportunities, uh, mental health services, uh, substance use services, health care, and all of those things. So that's the model that we want to go to. What, we're, what I'm talking about here tonight for the Armory is a temporary uh, stopgap measure in between. We are proposing this from April 1st to July 1st. Um, and to speak a little bit more to the specifics, we have a, a very rough design of 40 beds with plywood um, separation that the um, National Guard is, could help us construct. Uh, we have, uh, there's electrical that goes with that. Um, it would be staffed by a professional organization that is used to running, uh, running shelters. Um, we don't have the local capacity to do that. We tried to work with some of the local providers, um, but they are stretched to capacity. Uh, so we would be putting that out to bid and contracting uh, with providers who are um, experienced in doing this kind of work. Um, we've, we have projects around the state. We have something you know, really great going in Brattleboro. Uh, we're optimistic about our project in Bennington. Uh, we're trying a mobile shelter site. So these are shelters on, on, uh, on wheels and trailers in Rutland. Um, and in Montpelier, we thought we had uh, a really great um, option where we were going to lease a hotel and have a local provider run it, but that fell through. Uh, the provider was overextended. We thought we had 42 rooms there. We don't have that. We keep pivoting to whatever will work uh, to try to stand up shelters by this very short timeline of April 1st. And the April 1st date is there um, currently because, uh, as you all may recall, the hotel motel program, it ended for a portion of people last summer but our most uh, vulnerable, those who are in the hotels due to vulnerable and catastrophic eligibility. That's um, people, uh, families with children, people with disabilities, uh, people over the age of 60, uh, victims of domestic violence, those who may have lost their uh, housing to a natural disaster. Those folks that were in the hotel, they were extended through this April 1st. And that's an ongoing debate in the legislature as to whether that should end. The, the, the rationale behind extending them to April 1st was that the state would try to connect those people to housing in the meantime. And although it started out with about 1,300 households on July 1st, we still have over 600 households still in the hotels and motels under that, um, what was called Act 81, that extended them. That's set to end on April 1st, so that's why we're looking at April 1st to provide additional shelter space across the state for those people. Those folks are, like I said, it, a large proportion of them are families with children, a large proportion of them are people with disabilities, and a, a large number of those are uh, folks who are elderly. Um, so we are trying to stand up additional shelter space, and that's why uh, the April 1st date. We had looked at the armory. Um, we knew it was a possibility for several months. We had looked at it for other purposes, but nothing was really firmed up. Nothing was um, certain enough for us to come to the town to explore um, or to have a public forum or anything like that. But in recent months, in recent weeks, when that Montpelier option fell through, 
the National Guard is coming up against a deadline to have enough money to go uh, purchase their new armory uh, that they're looking to put forward. The transfer hadn't happened yet. The transfer did just happen um, in front of uh, the legislature. Uh, there's money in the budget to purchase the armory at, I believe, $890,000. So that's really what got the wheels turning just in the last couple of weeks. As soon as we knew that was a possibility, I reached out to Tom. Um, it wasn't public yet, so Tom briefed the select board in executive session uh, last week. And then this week, I testified in front of the legislature um, that we were pursuing this. Um, the budget was made public, so it's all public knowledge now. And it's at this point that we knew we had to do community engagement, and that's why I'm here with you tonight. Um, just a little bit more about you know, how fast moving this is. Much of it's tied to the budget. Um, it's tied to the state ownership of the armory. We got approval to buy. And then just to be clear about what we intend to say once again, it's a, it's a shelter, a temporary shelter from April 1st to July 1st with 40 beds staffed by shelter professionals. We are, um, we've started contact with law enforcement uh, to understand some of the impact on law enforcement to make sure we have that relationship there. Um, we have plans with local, we will make plans with local service providers to bring service to the shelter and also uh, transportation arrangements to bring people to the services that they need. This will be run according to our shelter standards. Um, so it's not what you might, some people might think of when they think of a low barrier shelter where there's drug use happening in and around the site. Uh, this would be run according to standards. They would have at least two staff members on 24-7 uh, enforcing the rules of the shelter, and we would have transportation in and out. I will tell you that I know there are a lot of um, stereotypes and misconceptions about people who are experiencing homelessness. I've visited a whole lot of people in the hotel motel programs in my first 10 months as uh, the new commissioner of DCF. And these are folks who are a heck of a lot like us. Uh, we are all not all so far away from experiencing homelessness ourselves. They have jobs, they have families, they have children, they have hopes and, and dreams just like you do. They don't want to be in the hotels. I'll tell you that that's another big misconception is that a lot of people are just um, there for a free ride and want to be in those hotels. It's really difficult living in those in those hotels um, from what I've seen and I've met a whole lot of good people there um, who are down on their luck who can just use some help and if we can connect them to services in a, in a shelter model like this as opposed to a hotel um, we'd be doing a lot better by them so I'm here to answer any questions that you might have hopefully get your support as a community in this um, temporary measure to provide some additional shelter space <coughs> for the, the Vermonters who, go, who are going through homelessness right now. Um, and open to your feedback and, and modification to the plans that we have um, to try to alleviate any concerns that you might have. Uh, so thanks for hearing me out. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna first start with uh, questions, questions from the board. Wait, wait, I mean, did that where do we folks, extension? Folks, can you wait to be called on, please? Yeah, Raise I'm going to have to call oh, on we everyone. Can't see you, or I'm sorry, we're we're all sort of co convening with ourselves because we can't see you're oh, cutting out. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll start if you don't mind, and then we'll go to the other members of the board. Uh, Chris, my understanding is that uh, the legislature just passed a, a budget amendment amendment for this current fiscal year that extends the motel program through the end of June. And based on what you just told us, it seems as though that would cover the period that you're trying to cover with this project. Would that obviate the need for this? So it, it, um, it might change the need some. What, what it has happened is that's a, it has passed the House. It has not passed the Senate. And what I'm being asked to do is stand up these five shelters in anticipation of something happening on April 1st that I don't know is going to happen or not. And we can't wait. We, we can't wait to start making the plans to start putting things together or they are not going to be ready on April 1st. I, I won't begin to try to predict whether the legislature 
will pass um, something that extends the, the hotel motel program. But even if it did, we have, like I said, 1,600 households in hotels and motels, and we're sometimes turning away 50 or 60 calls a night because we don't have enough hotel rooms. So whether or not it passes on April 1st to extend, we, we do need the additional shelter capacity. And the other piece of this that's, that's really strategic on our part is that we need to show the hotels and motels that we're willing to, to house people in other ways. I don't know if you all have seen like some of the rates that they charge. We're trying hard to negotiate those rates down. But when we fill up all of their rooms, they have no incentive uh, to, to, to dial those rates down. So there's also a bill proposed in the legislature to cap those rates at $75. Um, our, on average, we're paying uh, $135 a night per room. That's 40, about $40,000 a year per person uh, if they stay in a hotel for, for the full year. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, who's next? Uh, Danny, Vice Chair. Chris, thank you for being here. I think it's really important to have you here in person, so I really appreciate it. Um, you mentioned putting it out to bid to operators outside of Vermont. I'm curious when that might happen, What uh, if there's anything in the way of getting that process started, and then what if no provider is able to step forward? What's the next step? So we did um, put s something similar out to bid last summer. Um, and then decided not to do any other shelters at that time. So we had the bids already. We just asked them to rebid. So we have four providers who have bid. We have them already, and we just have to make a choice as to which one would be the best fit. Thank you. Kane. Um, this question pertains to the rushedness that we're all feeling right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, the, the Scott administration's made it no secret that they want this motel voucher program to come to an end. Um, and it's been, he's not made that a secret for years. Why, why rush it right now? Why not have worked this plan out over time to the end of the program instead of having to do this bum rush to April 1st? Yeah, we, we have been, uh, I'll say that DCF has been for a long time trying to uh, get other shelter providers to step up and, and get us to switch away from the hotels to the traditional shelter model, which works a lot better. It's really slow going. I, like I said, I think we have 500 shelter beds. We have plans to expand by another 180. Um, and, and there's money in the budget, in the governor's proposed budget to do that. Um, it, but that's really slow going, as I said. We've been trying to move away from the hotel motel program. There, the piece that we're um, proposing ending is um, the, what we call the cohort, the folks who were in last summer that got to stay through uh, April 1st. That's already on the books. That's already in law. That's set to expire unless the legislature does something else. Um, and then there's folks who are in there through adverse weather conditions or other eligibility. So it's not, I think it's been a long Hall to try to wind, unwind this program while more people are experiencing homelessness. So I wouldn't say it's a big rush for April 1st, but this is when the law is set to expire, when we have to be prepared to have more shelter space at that time. I'm not sure that I answered your question fully. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> Mike. Barnes. Yes, hi, Chris. Um, having had experience, I was over 30 years program director for USDA Rural Development, having worked with a lot of low to moderate income people, people yeah. of homelessness, et cetera. My concern is um, looking at the space. You mentioned helping people with families and stuff like that. You look at the armory, there's only two bathrooms, one, one male, one female. That creates an inherent problem with housing families in, 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 in that space. Can, can you address that? Yeah, so I think if we look at prioritization for who goes there, I said this in, in testimony, <clears throat> excuse me, testimony last week, is that congregate shelter of this sort, sort is not ideal for families. It's right. not best practice in general. Right. Um, you want to give people privacy and dignity and hopefully a, a locked door, but um, when you don't have a choice for that and you have to do something that's congregate, we're calling it semi-congregate if that's even a thing, to try to put up some partitions to make 
at least some screening and some some privacy we would be not be looking at housing families there as our first choice we are looking at the bathrooms noting that we might need to add an additional uh, an additional bathroom to make this work off in that time frame mm -hmm. yeah Alyssa? As a local elected official, I guess one piece I would just clarify is we were literally informed of this in the meeting, <laughs> just to say if there's any perception Tom told us you had texted him. Um, but I just feel like we're being put in a place uh, between obviously this proposal the state is advancing and concerns we're hearing from folks and constituents. So I guess, can you just speak to how you would anticipate working with the town? I mean, folks come to us in terms of services, you know, whether it's the library or our emergency services that we support as a town. Um, so just curious to know what that interaction would look like. Yeah, uh, sorry about the tech. <laughs> okay. Yeah, maybe we pause just a yeah. second. I think it's, it'd be good for them to hear that. If, okay. If we have 10 seconds, see if it'll go up, I don't know. Uh, might not. The joys of technology. Well, maybe not. <clears throat> no. All right. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I, I really don't think there's anything I can do. Okay. All right. No, last time it connected fast, so I thought yep. if it did, it was worth it. But. Sure. All right. We'll try to catch people up if uh, they miss something. Yeah. But, uh, so, if you wouldn't mind answering. Appreciate the question. Um, it's still very much in development for us as well. And as soon as you know we firm up plans, we would definitely want to be in communication with the town, like I said, around things like transportation, law enforcement, what other impacts it might have in either the neighborhood or the town in, in general. And are there ways that we can, can mitigate that? Are there ways that um, we can provide assurances to the town? Um, are there ways that we can provide resources to the town that would help uh, for that three month period? Okay. And we're I, absolutely happy to come back as you know more people become aware of this and maybe have and you all have had a chance to think about it and have um, more yeah. questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, for those of you that are online, I apologize again. We are having some technical connectivity problems. Um, uh, the question was uh, again: Why are we put in this? Uh, situation where we have less than a week warning before what appears to be a, a fairly imminent decision um, and Chris uh, apologized that he'd be willing to come back and address this again and he's looking forward to partner with the town um, let's take can we uh, uh, yeah do you have can we do a couple yeah. more? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think I'm curious if this is, you know, I think it was was published April 1 to June 1 originally, and you mentioned July 1. I assume that may or may not change based on legislature, et cetera. But um, is there a plan for the building after for the you know million plus going into it? Has that been discussed? It has not been. I think the state will have plans for it. Uh, obviously, I don't think they would be making the investments that, that, that we are. Uh, if there wasn't, but I don't know what those future plans are. I don't think there's anything set um, as to what they might want to do with it. Uh, yeah, Tom. So, Chris, that's that's one of the concerns I've heard from the community a lot over the past few days is that you're, you've got a real difficult problem to deal with this homeless population. You're investing in a, facil in a facility. Presumably, if you open it, this problem is not gone in a few months. So is temporary... What's been relayed to me by a lot of people is temporary, really not months, but years. Yeah, I, I know. I know better than to say temporary means temporary. I mean, we're we're opening up the Middlesex facility for uh, secure juvenile uh, youth treatment. That's that will will be temporary because we have plans on the horizon for a, a permanent facility. Um, I don't know exactly what the, the timelines are going to be. We're looking at April 1st to July 1st. We have money in the budget for three months. That's all we're planning for. Um, and there is not money in the budget beyond that. Um, so unless the, the uh, legislature or the governor changed his mind about adding additional money to the budget, it's a three-month plan. But the governor has presented a budget for the following fiscal year. Is there money to operate this facility in there? No. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
number of people uh, in the audience are going to want to speak. I think uh, maybe the way to do this is to have people come to the center, and I saw your hand first, if you wouldn't mind coming up here, and then others that would like to speak after her can come up behind her, and then we'll also bring in people from other side. Hmm? Can we, we're all just going to pause for one second because there's a lot of movement and I just want to make sure we get your name and everyone can hear you. Uh, sure, uh, hear. if you wouldn't mind moving that over, that would be great. Uh, Danny, are you then. timing? Um, yes. Yeah. Um, I was, I'm sorry to interrupt. I was wondering if you wanted to ask your question before the other questions about public process and it just seems like maybe there's um, time. That's up to the board. I'll be glad to. Uh, I'm going to suggest that everyone limit uh, their comments to two minutes in respect to the number of people that we've got here and here. Um, and then uh, afterwards, I'm going to the, ask if people have share similar concern as the speaker. So we'll, we won't have to repeat everyone sharing the similar concern. In your name, please. My name is Elaine. Elaine Holt. And my question, my also have visited up to that hotel motel in Barrie and it was bed drugs and alcoholism and drug addiction and the cops were there every other minute. <coughs> How would you propose to vet the people that are going to come to Waterbury? I, you know, the effect on our community will be grave unless things are in place. This rush doesn't work for me. You know, maybe they, you said, I, if I understood you, the state wants that money so the National Guard can put up a building for the National Guard. Well, maybe they better put woe on their reins until things are really worked through with a really a plan. It doesn't sound like there's a real plan yet. I mean, to me, there's no plan, and I'd like to see a clear plan. I'd like to see people vetted they're coming in and services in that building for them that are solid, and there's a beginning and end time. You, first, you said it's April until... July. Now you're saying, well, it might be, it might not be. That's too wishy-washy for me as a taxpayer. I don't like it. And I don't like that coming into my career. I'm all for a hand up, but not a hand out. If people are going to be there, they ought to work for the state, either mowing lawns, doing some kind of service. I, I listed a bunch of things they could do. You know, they could be custodians, <laughs> gardeners, shoveling, mowing, painting, road work, kitchen work, some office work. If the state wants to hand out money like they did to the people up there, it was a tragedy and it was vulgar. People just got money for sitting on their butts. I'm not for that at all, and I don't know how many of people in this community are for that. Well, I'm not. Can we not applaud? Is that something that we can ask folks to do, just let people speak one at a time and move through? Is that appropriate? Sorry, I'm looking at Tom. I didn't mean to be looking at Roger. Is that something we can ask? Are sure. you comfortable asking Sure. That? And again, I, what I was okay. going to do was going to just ask for a show of hands, uh, anyone that sort of supported the, the tenor of uh, what Elaine was saying. Uh, you can just raise your hands and uh, you. we'll have a, a sense of what the crowd support is. Okay, thank you. Is it okay if I respond? Yes, please do. I, I, I did just want to say that um, that's one of the problems with the hotel motel program is that there are no standards, there are no requirements, <laughs> there's no accountability, there are no services. Um, uh, uh, so they, one person at a time, so they we, are, we ask Chris. Some of their conditions are, are really poor. We shouldn't subject people to living there. And I, and I also just want to say, please don't use sweeping generalizations for these people. Um, a lot of them are working. A lot of them have to contribute 30% of their income to stay in the, in the hotels. Um, a lot of them have mental health or substance use issues. It's a difficult, difficult problem, and, it's, and people are complicated, just like every one of us in this room are complicated individuals. Um, so you, you may see some of the worst of it manifesting on the street or in the crime log, uh, but that's not the vast majority of the people that I've interacted with in these programs. Okay, thanks, Chris. Your name, please. Teresa Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, that's out of order. It's out of order, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you're still out of order. Is the set of rules that you mentioned, 
Is there a way for us to access those rules somewhere? Could we get the a link for those or something? Sure. And is this going to be a 27, a 24, 7 facility? Yes. And has the state looked at the Housing First initiative at all? Why, sure. I'm just curious about why we're not going in that direction. I think a lot of people in the legislature do want to go in that direction. That's but it's, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, show of hands. Uh, anyone supporting uh, the question that was asked? All right. Thank you. Chris Fiennes. Um, I just would like to say that to me, this seems like a knee jerk reaction to a, big, a bigger problem that's coming. Uh, I have been at several select board meetings encouraging the select board to try to pay attention to the ongoing drug and crime and uh, addiction problem that we have in this state that's not only consuming Burlington, as you've all have witnessed, but uh, it's consumed other towns in our little state of Vermont and a lot of uh, our bigger cities and towns throughout the United States. What bothers me is that seeing this thing come across the Pacific like a tsunami, there's been slow reaction by our state legislators to do anything about it. We had a lieutenant police officer, state police officer, in at the select board meeting one night talking about Second. things that... The, yes, we can hear you, but not see you. Things that the state can, that the town can do to uh, help try to ward off uh, this problem from getting worse in our own community. He spoke about the revolving door of the justice system, and I had him elaborate on that a little bit. It seems as though some of the policies that are being put forward by our state legislative body are enabling this crime and drug issue to grow bigger and bigger, and homeless issue grow bigger and bigger, continuously as we're asked to dole into our pockets and run faster to try to keep up with higher education taxes, higher municipal taxes, higher state taxes. And, and foot the bill on all these other things too. One of the questions I have, we have an elementary school just literally a stone's throw away from you have 10 seconds, Chris. this facility. What's that? You have 10, 10 seconds. seconds left. Okay. You know, what guarantees do we have there? And when it comes to uh, temporary facility, I question that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just hold your applause if you want to raise your hand in support. Thank you. I don't think there was a question there, so... Uh, Sure. Um, the, the question I was doing about clapping, they can't see us, and so in terms of helping the audience and the, the video world engage, clapping uh -huh. them to know the level they, of support. They can see. They can see you. Apparently, they can see us. It's right on the screen. So thank you. You're right in the center, select board. They're looking at you through the owl right there. Yeah, so they, they just can. keep commenting that they can't see us. Well, oh, they're commenting did. to you then, because okay. they're not commenting oh. to me. Uh, yeah. no, no, and they can't see us at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thank you. We'll see if we can make some adjustments. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Tamitha. Hi, Tamitha Thomas Hossi, and uh, my husband and I, along with 41 other families, live along the road up to the armory. I think there are three things I hope you take back and understand. One is that you are placing this in a residential area. Two, it's a residential area that has been kicked in the teeth over and over and over again, especially over the last six months. And so whether it's just a perception of decreased property values or a very real thing, on top of the flooding, we can't take it anymore. <laughs> Um, we are modest means folks um, living on those houses, in those very small houses going up that road. It's where we teach our children how to ride our bikes, where we take our dogs out for walks. Um, and we want to be promised some level of safety and security remains for 43 families. The last thing I'll say is I had the pleasure and honor of being on the Duxbury Select Board for many years, chairing that select board. And I can remember if we wanted to ditch a road, if we wanted to create a new culvert, we had to make sure that every fish was taken care of, that everything was done properly. And so to come in and rush this process into a community without careful thought, not only to us, but to the people who you claim to be taking care of, there are no services here. We have no emergency medical anywhere near us. 
We have barely any behavioral health or mental health services in this community. We're we're talking about families. Families. So if you're, if you're, no you're families, saying that you're trying the, to do the better adults. than the hotel but program, the time, then locating in a community other than ours is going to be a better that they need to get out, so I don't know. Sorry, okay, sorry for the... Yeah. Thank you. Chris, do you feel obliged to respond to that? No. Sorry, guys. Hang on just a minute, please. Yeah. Can we uh, try to... I'm not host, so I can unmute people. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, if you can, everyone online can I refrain. I though. Someone muted me. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thoughtful. Well, then they can. Okay, your name, please. My name is Rachel Suter. I'm a resident of Stowe Street, and I would like to voice my support for this project. I think that if the state and the town can overcome the barriers that we've spoken about, we shouldn't let our fear and a scarcity get in the way of providing support to other Vermonters who are experiencing something that's incredibly difficult. Uh, generosity <coughs> and compassion are the Vermont values that I want to put forward and say that um, we should do what we can for people who need the help. Okay. Thank you. Support for that. Up. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I can take one more here, and then I'm going to start interspersing people from uh, the online world who have had a tough time of it. Hey, Your no name. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm a college Yeah. And so, uh, first, uh, a concern, uh, sir, when you first spoke to us about this uh, this meeting. Sorry, uh, my concern is, is that when this gentleman first started speaking about uh, this proposition, he mentioned that this would be a transitionary place for families. Well, he was quick to retract that later on in his discussion. I don't think I ever said that. You would say well, let's let's go for it. Anyways, so my question is, is uh, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to. Judge or, or kind of makes Jerry for anybody in any, any sort of support <laughs> situation, but what history has said with the other programs that the state has done when it comes to housing situations like this, especially with like the hotel program, there's been a need for other resources, other services, and there's been altercations, which has been called cause for need for policing. We're in a town where we do not have a police force; we have a limited force provided by the state police department. So my question is, with this facility, when these additional resources are going to be required, where those resources are going to be come from? What's the plan for those resources? Who's going to pay for those resources? Because as a resident, seeing our tax dollars go up 3% or more every year, <laughs> we don't have a lot more room to go. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Can you hey, respond? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry if I did insinuate that it would have been families. I think I was talking about overall in the hotel motel program. There are a lot of families there. Congregate shelter is not ideal for families, and that's why we would steer away from families for this um, this particular shelter. And how about the? He was asking who's going to provide the services uh, that'll be yeah, needed. Yeah, I think that's all things that we're talking about now, and, and resources that we would need to talk to the town about um, in other communities where we have shelters or where we have had to have security at the hotels and, and motels in particular towns where we have a large hotel full of people um, and you don't have shelter standards. Um, security was necessary to come in there and we would, re we would either pay for the security or reimburse the town for that security. I do not foresee that run in a shelter that's run properly by professionals uh, as opposed to a kind of a Wild West hotel. Uh, and I'll just add that it does put us in a bit of a, a bind because uh, sometime before midnight tonight, we'll be approving the proposed budget for the town. Uh, we have not had any time to take into consideration the need for increased security or any of these other services that may be needed. Uh, I'm going to recognize some of them from here, and then we'll come back to the line. Uh, yeah, Ingrid, Ingrid Jonas. Has Ingrid been. Jonas. All right. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Um, Commissioner, thanks for taking the time and um, thanks Select Board for hosting this meeting. Um, I do have just uh, several questions regarding clarification at this point. Um, if you could 
um, Commissioner, if you could please help us understand um, like how many staff members would work at this um, site, what kind of services would be provided and what would the hours be? And what did you mean by, you said something in the beginning that the police, um, I don't remember the term if you said they were on board, but I want to know more about that. Um, and also, what are the statistics that you have from other communities? Like what services tend to um, be relied upon in communities where these um, resident where these shelters are placed? Like what what are we looking at for um, pressures in the community and on workers, et cetera? Thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, we just had an initial contact with the uh, state police Berlin barracks is all we've done at this point. This is all, like I said, very new to us. And so we haven't made a lot of those contacts yet. Um, as far as shelter standards, I'm happy to kind of share those with folks. Um, I can send those to the to the select board so you can see how we typically run uh, our traditional community based shelters. Um, and what kind of services that we provide. Generally speaking, we bring people um, to the services that they need. We provide the transport. We're gonna talk to Green Mountain Transit about a, a, an additional stop there, if that makes sense. Um, but otherwise we provide the transportation uh, to get people to their medical appointments, to um, job interviews, to um, mental health and substance use treatment uh, that they might need. Um, so it's a variety of services depending on the individual uh, that'll that'll come along with this shelter space. And as far as impacts, I think it you know it really depends. But I'll, I'll stick with what I said earlier, which was in a well-run shelter of 40 individuals run by professionals, um, we don't anticipate a lot of security issues. Um, the staffing is typically at least two people 24/7, if not more. So um, uh, two people at least, and then plus additional administrative uh, if we need it. Um, also other service providers could potentially be in the building at times, uh, food delivery, potentially food preparation. Um, we, we haven't totally fleshed out the plans for uh, how this particular shelter will run. All right, thank you. Uh, Lisa? My name is Lisa Walton. Um, I was just hoping that you could speak a little more to where these um, people are coming from. You mentioned, I think, 2,400 people that are already being housed or are looking for house, <laughs> and uh, whether there's an influx of people um, where they're coming from, and then I may have another question based on that. Yeah, thanks for the question. I meant to mention it earlier. We're trying to set up five uh, shelters across the state in the communities most affected. Um, to alleviate pressure in the hotels in those areas. So those folks would come from Washington County. Um, if we knew they had a connection to Waterbury or um, uh, potentially um, uh, other contacts here that would make it make more sense for them to be in Waterbury, we would, we would uh, look at those people. Uh, but generally speaking, it'll be from people who are already in hotels or experiencing homelessness in Washington County. And where the majority of those come from? Are those Vermonters that have unfortunately become homeless or have they been brought in from other states? Yes. Are they coming in from other borders, northern or southern border? Uh, do we have that kind of information? Um, when people show up and say they are a Vermont resident or planning to stay in Vermont, they are eligible for housing. I'll tell you the vast majority of people that I've talked to are locals, are from Vermont. There's a real misperception that people are from away. Um, that they've come here attracted by the benefits or by a free hotel room. Um, but there are a lot of people who do have connections to Vermont. The vast majority of the people that I've talked to in these hotels are connected to Vermont. We do what's called the coordinated entry screening to try to get as much background information about the people who are in the program as possible so that we can hopefully fit them up with housing applications, subsidies if they're uh, qualified for its services if they need them. Um, so I'll say that uh, th there is a big perception that people are coming from out of state, but that's not been, been our experience. But we don't know what percentage are our people that have lived in Vermont for a period of time. I don't I don't know that we ask that. Are you a native Vermonter or how long have you been here? I don't think we do collect that. So you'd like something we would want to collect, but I understand that's not mm -hmm. something that you should personally have to do. 
Um, I, I feel badly for the select board being put on the spot like this. And I feel badly for the townspeople who also are sort of scrambling to get answers to these questions. And I think whenever the government does something hastily, it rarely turns out well. And temporary usually becomes permanent. And for that reason, I don't think it's about fear, uh, as somebody has suggested, but it's more about just the realities of this situation and what it might mean for our community now and in the future. So. Okay, thanks. Anyone want to say hands on that one? Great. Thank you. We'll go back up here. Do we have another? Uh, it looks like Lindy's iPod. Lindy's iP iPod. Wow. Lindy's iPod. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lindy Garfield. Um, I just want to say I agree with everything <laughs> Elaine Holt said and the previous um, person who asked a question. It just seems to me this is not very well thought out. Um, and why try to put it together without the specifics worked out? And to throw this upon people, just dump it out there. <laughs> Just it's not it's not right and it's not fair um, to do that. So uh, anyway, I don't really have a question. Just just comments. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lindy. Want to raise your hands for Lindy? There we go. All right. Uh, back over here. Yes. Hi, I'm Beth Ann Mayer. I live over on Randall Street. Have for forty five years. And in the last three years, I've actually spent a lot of time with people who are living in shelters, in hotels, and are living unsheltered. And um, these are our people. They're our brothers and sisters. Uh, they literally are. I run into people all the time in this situation who consider Waterbury their home, but they can't live here because there's no, you can't get housing here. Uh, it's an economic problem. The, the rents are double what they were 10 years ago, and the incomes are not. It's straight economics, and the people that flounder are the people that are most vulnerable, uh, who can't keep up with this. So I think, I think that we need to welcome this. We need to welcome the fact that DCF is being an activist and setting up a shelter. I don't think that's happened before. Uh, that they're gonna staff it, and that if we work with them in a non-adversarial way, I think that there's an excellent outcome. I mean, I live on Randall Street, been affected by the floods, and you know, if I get flooded out, I'll be one of the first ones to go up in the armory. It'll be great to have that resource. All right. Yeah, we are an island. island. Yeah. Um, I would like to yeah, say that right. last week when we had four nights that were below 10 degrees, we opened up a church basement in Montpelier without any publicity. And just by word of mouth, we had 10 people come in who would otherwise have slept out in the cold at less than 10 degrees. Uh, this can be life-saving. Two of those people had serious health problems. And then I think okay, one guy was in a wheelchair. Beth Ann, you know, hands for Beth Ann. Thank you. All right, uh, back over here. Who Marcy, Marcy Blumbo. Marcy? Marcy Blava. Mm -hmm. She unmuted. Marcy, you with us? I'm here, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't raise my hand or anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know where you got me. Okay. <laughs> I'll uh, unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Who else we got next? Uh, Glenn Anderson. Glenn Anderson. Hey, how how are y'all? Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. So, you know, I guess I basically just want to keep it short. I'll just uh, weigh in. I first of all want to reiterate the uh, the importance of these services, and I think that um, in whatever conversation happens and ensues hereafter, I think it's critical to keep in mind the people that would be using it um, and understand that this is a real issue. 
the problem that I have, and I think um, many of our community do as well, I think that there's a reality of what the state is asking us to do, um, not just because it's rushed, but because there's an assumption. And there's an assumption that with a you know ninety a $90 million bond coming up, uh, whether there are kids in this facility or not, that was one of my questions. I think it's been answered. Uh, whether that's just for the temporary plan or whether that's for the full-time plan, I don't know. Um, does that mean that it will be used to justify you know, more bed base for the enrollment levels that are declining, uh, just to justify a school bond vote? I think the bigger picture, though, and when I'm looking at water issues um, and expanding service, it's great for us to grow our economy. But if the state keeps coming in here and saying to us, we want to build a city at all costs, and they don't have a traffic study, and we don't have a really legitimate plan for public transportation um, and for traffic solutions, I have a problem. So can you hear me okay? Is everybody like- Yeah, yeah. I think so. Okay. I just wasn't sure. We're having so many difficulties with the tech here. So towards that end, I'll keep it short. I just hope that we could keep perspective, not be dismissive to the people that need services, and work towards that, but not necessarily have these these backhanded uh, taxes on us that we'll have to pay, whether it's a school bond tax down the road, whether it's uh, just increased services, that's fine. But let's be upfront about it. Let the state come in here and start underwriting some of those tax cuts or make it better with a traffic study, you know, and so we have some better public transportation. Oh, sorry, so, I have two minutes. Oh, there. thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Glenn. Uh, he was asking about kids uh, at this facility. Not going to happen. No. Yeah, but how about the future, right? So that's the bigger question. Three month plan. So uh, you, why don't you just speak for yourself? I don't want to put words in your mouth. So I, I think I said before that this would not be, um, I would not be appropriate for families. We would be looking for people, for adults, probably single, some couples um, for this facility. And that's just for the three months of the plan, or would that be for the entirety of ever the as the plan stands? There's no intention to use this as a shelter after the three months. Okay. And, and Thank I, you. I do just want to say again, I, 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 I would prefer to do a longer range plan, uh, earlier community engagement. Uh, you guys are breaking up again. We lost them. All good questions, Glenn. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I hope I didn't crash it this time. I mean, I think this is this is the start of it right now. Is how can we react in a way that, other than saying, "Okay, never mind," um, this is something that we really need, and we want to have your partnership in this, and we want to be good neighbors, um, and do this in a way that has the least amount of negative impact in the community. And I think it could be a really wonderful thing. Um, these are folks who really need help. We've moved twelve thousand people through the hotel and motel program since twenty twenty. So people come into homelessness and hopefully they come back out and get to more permanent housing. Um, and with some community engagement and, and services, we think this could be a positive, very positive thing for the people who uh, pass through this shelter over the next three months and get to get to something more permanent. So what I'm hearing is the decision is not ours, but sort of the path and services and assistance can decisions can be made based on the issues that are raised by the public and the questions that we have? I, I mean, I think so. I, I'm being told stand up these five shelters mm -hmm. across the state in the next couple of months. We're not. We're not. Excuse me, if you wouldn't mind, Chris has got the floor. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer to this is. If the state owns that 
property. I think it's a, a, a legal use of the property, but we do want to hear from you. We want to hear how we can how we can modify our plans if it's not working for the for the community. Okay, thanks. Next. And Roger, if yeah. it's okay, I, I recognize Roger is running the meeting. I just want to know, like folks on Zoom, folks in the room, we're all here because we care about this community. I just want to recognize we do have a full agenda. It's a long night. I recognize I occupy one of the five elected positions at the seat, but I would ask folks to consider highlighting the questions. We are trying to get answers. The commissioner has already said he would come back. So raising an issue if you have an issue, but we don't have time for everyone to give a political speech tonight. And I just ask that we say, if you, the question has already been addressed, you consider getting out of line. But with the amount of folks here and the amount of things here, I will ask Roger what motion needs to be made at a certain point. We want to hear from folks, but we just ask that in doing so, you're considerate of all of our time here together. Thank you. Hey, Alyssa, you guys broke up before, but did you get to the traffic study? Is there one that exists? Thanks. Um, I, I'm not aware of a traffic. He's on the line, just like yeah. Us. We'll just leave that one then. Okay, uh, you have the floor. And you I, I just I apologize. I didn't hear the answer to my question. You guys cut out, so thank you. Yeah, I got you, Karen. Thank you. I'm Karen Driver, um, and I'm glad I'm following you, Beth Ann Mayor, because I think she knows what she's talking about. I know she knows Thomas so in central Vermont and um, I feel as, as she does that this is an opportunity for Waterbury to really step up and shine and I, I know that Waterbury can do it because I know we have the human resources that we need and um, and I know that we help each other really well and as long as we do see people as our, our brothers and sisters um, I, I I think we can do this well, and I would be so proud if if we did say yes, and if we did our very best to make it make it work well for everybody. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Carrie. Hands for Carrie. All right. Thank you. Who we got over here? M. Mary Ellen Lampson. Yeah. Yeah. Mary Ellen Lampson. M. Lampson. Hi there. Sorry. Um, yeah. So one one question I have is they're saying obviously April first to July one. What happens July one when the shelter shuts down? Do we then have tent cities at Dak Row, at Rusty Parker Park, at the Park and Waterbury Center? These people aren't just going to up and leave Waterbury. What's going to happen? I mean, we've seen what happened in other towns. Um, and the other concern that Ellie brought in the beginning of the drug use, you can say, you know, initially he said, oh, it's families and families, but then we're being told it's not going to be families in these shelters. Not that families are the only ones that use drugs, not that single people are the only ones that use drugs, but the likelihood of drug use happening, being brought in, um, into town more and more, obviously it's gonna come with this, we all know it. Um, so what is the, the way to address those issues? Mm -hmm. Chris, you have a question, uh, an answer? I'm sure, I just would go back to my answer about it being a properly run shelter. Um, and with you know supervision and security, there are four 40 beds I think that we're looking at. Um, I think it's it's highly likely would be uh, targeting folks um, in the program who are singles or couples, uh, perhaps folks with disability, perhaps some people who are older. Um, it's hard to predict you know what the population will look like that's in there, though we are saying not um, children, uh, not families with children at this point. Um, like I said, the plans are still evolving. We're happy to, to come back as soon as we have firmer plans uh, on what the shelter operation would look like to, to brief the select board, to keep having an open conversation with the community. Um, and, and drugs have been mentioned a couple of times, Chris. Sure. What are the security considerations that prevent drug use on, in the facility or around it? Well, it's a, a violation of the rules of the shelter to use um, use drugs in the shelter, you'd be ejected from the shelter. Um, as far as people and with the wind down, I think was one of the, the questions as right. well. Um, we would, you know, probably place those people in, in hopefully have found them permanent housing, but if not place them in, uh, in other shelters and other areas at the end of the three months. Okay. John. Uh, John Hossie, O'Hare Court. <laughs> Uh, Chris, just a couple of clarifying questions. So it's a 24-7 man shelter, correct? Correct. But we do not have a police force that's 24-7 
within one of them. And the part-time state uh, police officers is basically <laughs> non-existent as far as most of us are concerned. Anyway, we've already had crime in our area. We've had our cars all broken into in our area. The question is twofold. One, it's 24-7 shelter, but people are not going to be there 24-7. So who's policing them? And two, if you've got 40 beds, but 80 people want to show up, what do you do with the overfill? It's, it's not a shelter where people can, it's not a, um, a shelter where people would just show up at the door. We would be coordinating it through other um, service providers through our coordinated entry through our, our phone line. We don't send people there unless there's an empty bed for them to, to go to. So it's not going to be like the line at the door like you might see at a seasonal shelter in Burlington where it's just a walk-in. It's not that kind of shelter. So word of mouth is a powerful thing. And yeah, people are desperate. They never go to shelter in the top of the armory. Yep. It's supposed to turn them away. Possibilities. The people running the shelter would have to determine where those folks are. And where do they go? It's a, it's a good question. Where do they go now? So we're a magnet for the unhoused, effectively, at this point. You, you could say that. You could also describe it as. Um, you speak up. You could also describe it as being uh, one of the many communities that are, are being a part of the, of the solution who are trying to. Uh, to offer some of their resources to a, a problem that's widespread it's across the state. It doesn't just happen in Burlington. It doesn't just happen in Rutland. You know, we've seen people, I drive down Route 2 every day on my way to work, and there were 10 people parked there along the river uh, for a number of months. Um, it's not an everybody else problem. It's an everyone problem. It is an everyone problem. I get that. I understand the plight of your work, and I can appreciate the challenge you have. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Uh, if I could just follow up, Chris, my understanding from what you said is that this is people enter the shelter by referral, not by walking up Armory Drive. That's correct. So, okay, that, that, that helps. Um, anyone online? Um, Liz Schlegel. Liz? Hi, I want to um, thank everybody for uh, this conversation. It's um, challenging online but you're all doing a great job and i want to ask these questions that i apologize i might have missed um during one of the the dropout periods so um chris i was just curious about um the services that would be provided i know you said you'd be putting it out to bid for an agency but um Will they there be a kitchen or cooking space or showers or anything like that available to people? Um, what kinds of services will be available to them to take care of themselves? So I guess it Looks is like you left. Yeah. We heard you. It literally just dropped out. Hey, while we're here, did anybody hear the answer to the traffic studies problem? Do we have any kind of solution for that yet? Glenn, do we need a traffic study? There are, if it's 40 people, they won't all have cars necessarily. When the National Guard was there, it was more than that. Yeah, I guess I, I might be expanding it a bit, but I just feel like it's this like ever exponential growth of, you know, move to the city model. And it's like, we don't have a public transportation plan that I think is <laughs> effective at the point. Glenn, Liz? You're live again. Liz, it's your turn to speak, please. We did not hear you um, when you spoke before. So if you could tell yeah. us again. Um, my questions were about um, what kinds of other services will be available to people there in terms of um, kitchen services? Are there showers? Are there um, 
a place for them to cook and store groceries. It It is um, a challenging building, as I recall. And so we want, I want to just understand what um, could be done to modify it, to make sure it's a place where people could actually be okay to live. And I want to go on record as saying, I support this. I, given how many people um, became homeless or so close to homeless from flooding, um, we cannot say that this is not a concern for us. We have lots of folks who are in our community who are struggling with this on a daily basis. And so this is, um, you know, our, our fight too. But I am curious about how that building um, will be made a, a safe and comfortable place to live. Yes, Th thanks for the question. Um, it is, we are gonna do minimum fit up because it is temporary. <clears throat> so we are trying to keep costs down. Uh, we are planning to have a food preparation area. We are planning to have ability to for folks to store their belongings. Um, and then th it's really critical that we connect with service providers to make sure they can either come to uh, to the armory or have folks transported to where their their services are provided. Uh, but it's all part of uh, what we call complex care for the individuals who are experiencing homelessness to try to get them stability, get them on their feet, and get them to a permanent housing situation. Okay, thanks. Up here. Uh, Chris Wood, Old Year Court. Um, so just for context, uh, where I live is right at the corner of Old Year Court and Armory Drive. And my first question for you is, have you been up to the Armory yet? Look at the facility? Yes. You have, okay. So it, um, that drive goes right by my house, and the back side of it um, goes down to the local community store. So I'm going to be at a kind of focal for traffic there. And one of the reasons I ask is because FEMA was up there this last summer because of flooding, and there's a lot of traffic. Before that, the state used it as storage um, for their material when they were doing the, um, the ramp. And the... That street up through there is in rough shape, like really rough shape. Uh, the guardrails are falling apart. The asphalt is falling apart. And if you're putting buses up through there and any other traffic, you're going to pound the snot out of that street up through there. It needs work bad already. So I don't know if there's any provisions. I believe it's a private street. It doesn't belong to the state. But I hope that there'd be some sort of provisions and. and remediating that street up there because this had a lot of traffic and it's really in poor shape. Um, my next question for you is, it's kind of a follow up to the vetting process. If people are in the homeless shelter, do they need to register on the sex, sex registry to be in there? Yes. And so we, we had access to know that there's people up there that are on the sex offender registry. Yes. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a straight shot to the school up across the brook. Um, and then, you know, and the other piece of that whole thing is, you know, having been up there, that property is bound. You've got the interstate, you've got a, a river that's enough. I mean, if you really want to get across the winter time, I guess I suppose you could. So there's only one way in or out. And we've certainly found that during the flooding. We were in Ireland twice. And, yes. um, so that place is isolated during flooding because that, that bridge goes into water. You can't get to it. Um, so just so I don't miss any questions here. I didn't make I've been cutting everyone out there too, so I'm gonna ask you to let someone know. You know thank you so much for this. So I'm, I'm done. Yeah, everyone's gotten only two minutes. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay, I had a couple more questions, but thank you. Thank you. you can email them. Thanks, Thanks. Ask them. Okay. I, I will just say that there um we do house sex offenders and, and we do not place them in the same hotels as where we place families with children. Um, I don't, I'm going to be very honest here and say, I don't know what the plan would be for the armory. I would need to, to check with our, like our shelter standards and what those screening processes would be. You have to be, uh, fair in some ways, um, to who you let into a shelter. You can't discriminate for a number of reasons. Um, but I think sex offender is actually one of the, uh, reasons where you could say that that person is more appropriately placed somewhere else than in a congregate group area. Okay. Um, do you want to address the... The road issue. Sure, just just about the road. Um, we actually did get a quote to pave that road this year. It wasn't initially in our 
tentative paving plan that I work on with the public works director. The select board finalizes the plan in the spring. Um, but that road is eighty ninety thousand dollars to repave. If the state wanted to do it, we wouldn't argue. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to say aloud that when I arrived in Waterbury in 2014, I was homeless. And I got a job and I slept on a couch until I could find an apartment. That leads me to my question. You said 30% of the income uh, has to go. We're out again. Does anybody um, know if this agency is buying this building but only going to use it for three months? Isn't that weird? They keep referring to it as temporary, but the plan is they're going to raise more money, and then in July it's going to be a more permanent thing. I think because they're buy they're buying the building. Is buying the building. Not they are not buying the building. It's a oh, swap okay. between two different agencies. But so then that agency will own this building now, but they're only going to use it for three months? The state will own the building. And the state will determine what the building's purpose is moving forward. Uh, well, I live uh, in Meadowcrest, so I'm not overly close to this. I have a lot of compassion for the homeless. I think a lot of us here do. But um, this kind of size, I think, will have an impact on the character of Waterbury. It'll change. And I say that with a level of confidence. My son is a lieutenant for the Burlington Fire Department. He's been there for 10 years. And as the homeless population has increased, it's changed Burlington a lot over the years. We will see changes here. And when you say it's going to end, I, I doubt that. It's good. This Once they build it, that's something that's going to probably be here for good. And um, I'm just not sure that's the right, right location. It is in close proximity to the school. That's not not always a great combination. Um, but, I, but I do have compassion for the homeless. And I, I want to see us help them. But um, 40 beds is a lot. And um, the other thing is it's, it's going to impact services. And if we don't think this out ahead of time and figure out the impacts and the changes and some of the examples of other communities that have done this and it's not gone so well, then it will happen to us and we'll just kind of walk into it gradually and it won't be fun. So I do have those concerns. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, thank you. Hands for John. Are we, can we get Anne online or anybody else? You can try. Anne, can you speak? I guess not. Okay. Hi, my name is Nora Miller. I live on Winooski Street. I am not a native Vermonter. I hail from the northern border up in Maine, uh, but I've lived here for several years now, and I have been volunteering with the crew, flood recovery response, as well as with the Good Neighbor Fund, and this is an urgent need in this community. I work every day receiving calls from folks who are either currently unhoused from the brink of being unhoused, here in Waterbury, and that's because they had COVID, couldn't go to work that day, broke their leg, whatever it is, their car broke down. This is an urgent need, not only in the state of Vermont, but in this community. But I appreciate the position you're in, and I don't envy you because this is very fast moving, a lot of logistics and concerns about the location and how you're going to run it. And like any good program, I hope you have clearly stated goals and a process for evaluating whether you achieve those goals. Do you, are you able to share with us the program goals, your evaluation plan, and then also what community in, influence or perception or experience be part of that evaluation plan? I really think I need to bring back the shelter experts to speak to, the, to this group. I'm not an expert in running shelters. I knew to the Agency of Human Services actually 10 months ago, but we do have a lot of people on staff who grant out money, provides shelter expertise, hold those shelters to standard, um, measure all of those, um, look at all those measurables to see what works and what doesn't. So we could definitely have students come back and, and speak to you about what's appropriate for a shelter, what outcomes we're looking for.
How's it going? Harry Stark, Guptal, uh, Chris, thank you for being here in person. And I want to thank the select board for giving everybody a chance to speak. It's, it's awesome to see how many folks are uh, getting up here and voicing their views. I, I think it's important that we just talk about the reality we're in right now, which is that Vermont is in the grips of a humanitarian crisis. And we have the second highest rate of unhoused folks in the country. And that reality already costs a tremendous amount of money. It's already posing a ton of difficulties. And the solutions that we're talking about, you know, standing up five new shelters, they're, they're not great solutions. They're totally imperfect. But the alternative, So my question is less to the, the select board, and it gets more to the room, which is that given that this problem isn't going anywhere, and we're already spending a tremendous amount of resources on it, what would it take for each of you to get on board with some form of solution that enabled us to, to move away from folks who are currently planning to live in the streets or part of the motel program? And I think if there, if there are things that the commission things that the select board can do to get us there, let's talk about that. Because this problem is it's not going anywhere. It's just going to get harder. It's just getting more expensive. And I see this as the first step in a number of hopefully better steps that are going to move us closer to more of a sustainable solution. Thank you. Okay. Hands for Harry. OK. I guess we'll go right here. How you doing? Steve Fry here. Hello, Harry L. Just two real quick things. Is it unfair to ask the state to commit to the security, the policing of this right off the bat? Just a yes or no. I mean, we've talked about it. It seems to be an overlying concern for everybody. Mm -hmm. We have state workers returning. We have influx of people. It's a busy area, busy town, busy time of the year. So I'd just like to hear a commitment from the state saying, yes, we are going to start amping up police, providing resources for additional policing around the, around the clock. If you put this, I mean, you basically you've said it's going in regardless. So to, to commit to those resources, the ambulatory, police, all the other things that are involved in putting something like this here, I'd like to hear a commitment saying yes. And then the other, one of the other concerns is, and we all kind of seem to agree, is once there's a temporary shelter, temporary becomes permanent real easy. Is there some type of commitment from the state to say, all right, Waterbury, look, we know we're rushing this in. <coughs> we want to be out by June, come June or July, whatever the hell it was. We want to, we'll take in the consideration, we'll sit here and have another meeting and talk about what we're going to do next before we jam something else in there and commit to that and almost like a contract. And if we don't agree to anything past July 1st, is it legal? Is, it, is, it, is there any basis to say, okay, we want to shut this down? Because if this becomes an epic failure come July 1st, do we want to have escape route. Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. Um, Hands for Steve. Thank you. I, I want to be Chris. careful because I don't want to promise any, make any promises that I can't keep. This is a, a problem that's, that's fast moving. It's complicated. The legislative dates might change. The needs of our homeless population might change. But I will commit to you that if we do anything different, we're planning to do anything different on July 1. We'll be back here well before that to, to ask you about it. Um, and as far as um, security and impact on services, um, I think we need to really assess what that looks like, what the needs are, and if the town needs more resources um, to feel good about um, you know, safety and security up to the plate and support that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'll try one more online. Eric Gross, Madeline Sullivan. Yep. Hello. Hi, Eric. Thank you. So <clears throat> I live on Union Street, right on the bottom of Armory Drive. I've flooded twice this year. I'm still trying to rebuild from that. Uh, homeless shelter right up the street is not ideal. Um, I have a lot of concerns like everyone else does. But a lot of this is because of the St. Albans Armory has PCBs in it. Um, doesn't this one also? So that's okay for homeless people, but not for the National Guard. <laughs> I, I do think it. Ha I'll have to check with you. 
uh, confirm this, but I do believe it's been tested. Um, the air quality has been tested already uh, before the sale, of, before the National Guard sold it. But I'll have to get back to you. I think Buildings and General Services has already done that testing, and I think it's cleared. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Rachel Muse, the director of the Waterbury Public Library. Uh, I think a lot of folks here know public libraries are on the front line of the housing crisis. Uh, we offer a safe haven of heat and air conditioning, public restrooms, computers and internet, a space where people can spend a lot of time without spending a lot of money. Uh, the Waterbury Public Library serves all members of the community, regardless of housing status. Uh, my staff, as well as being really wonderful with tra traditional library services, have also been trained in mental health first aid, we have access to Narcan, we provide basic hygiene supplies. Uh, we're definitely not social workers or counselors, but we do the best we can without judgment, and public libraries frequently end up filling the gaps where uh, shelters like this uh, aren't necessarily meeting people's needs. Uh, I've al we've already heard a lot of questions about the details of the shelter, and I just very much ask that the, the library be included uh, as we get any information about those details, because I do think, especially considering this shelter is a just a half mile walk from the library, that we're going to be uh, right there when people are looking for somewhere to be. Uh, but I also want to ask that we hear more about what resources might be available to town staff as far as things like training go. Um, we we really need to know more about what this population is going to look like, but I suspect that we're going to find that there are gaps in our training and knowledge for how to manage the situations that we're going to find in the shelter. So please do keep us in the loop and remember that the library is going to be impacted by this as well. Thank you. Hands for Rachel. Thank you. Any <laughs> comment on my that? My only comment on that is that libraries really are on the front lines and they are the unsung heroes of helping people experiencing homelessness, especially if they need to charge a phone, uh, access services online. What we will have at the armory is electricity, is access to the internet. So if folks need to do um, search for an apartment, um, connect with employment, uh, do some of their virtual appointments, they'll be able to do that on site at the armory. Uh, but I, I can't expect that they, they would use the valuable resource of the library uh, as, as many of us do. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. John Lee Griffin. Um, my questions for you would be, if residents don't follow the rules and are asked to leave the shelter, I'm not really that worried about the shelter and the rule following the folks, what happens to that individual? I, I'm not exactly sure of, of the answer to that. They're not allowed into the shelter, but I don't know if they get, like, get a, a, a ride to wherever they want to go, or I'm not sure what happens, but I'd have to get back to you on that. And then um, another question I would have for you guys, are you intending to involve the Zoning Planning Commission in these retrofits or changes <laughs> to the building? Um, it's, be, it's currently empty. It was a warehouse for armaments. Now it's going to be changed to potentially cooking making meals, housing people, changing bathrooms. Um, what involvement is the town going to get in that effort? So we'll have to keep talking to the town, but it's my understanding that as long as we're working within the envelope of the building, we're OK. But I, you know, I'm not sure if I have a full understanding of that. So my understanding, it's preliminary, is that uh, they'd likely need a change of use permit from our development review board. Um, that being said, the state is essentially exempt from most of our zoning bylaws. So it's, it's not necessarily the highest bar to clear. Um, there's, there's other details to it, but I want to share those with the select board. And then I have one last brief question for you. Um, the purchase price of the building, divided out by 50 beds, divided out by 90 days, is actually $197 a day, which is more expensive than the hotel motel voucher program. Um, which leads me to believe that there is a long-term plan that's not being shared with us. I do believe that the administration is very capable of planning more than 90 days. Um, it'd be really nice to know what thoughts and discussions have had occurred. I understand that maybe there is some need for you know executive sessions or whatnot, but it would be nice to be part of those discussions. Sure. So I don't know of a future use of the program at the price you, you talk about divided by that's that's all correct but then the state has an asset at the end of the day um, so I don't know what the future plans are if you know there are any I would be sure to let the, <laughs> the folks know that they need to come and engage the town before moving forward with any of those <laughs> those plans DCF does not have any plans for that that space afterwards hands for John. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Madeline. Roger. I just, is there Sorry. a time that you want to end or you want to go for it? Yeah, I recognize that we're four minutes over. Um, uh, but I do, because uh, people have uh, been very patient, uh, I'd like to extend if, you, if it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to ask. Yeah, I'm question. thinking we'll try to end this by 9 o'clock. Okay. Madeline. Hi, thank you so much, and everybody. Um, as someone who manages a congregate living facility of another nature, I know that often it's not the clients or the residents who bring challenges, but their visitors, their family, it's it's the nature of the work. So I'm just curious about the parameters for visitation and such at a shelter such as this. Thank you so much. Um, I will. I don't know what the plans are for the, the running of this shelter. Um, I know there are typically rules around visitation yeah. depending on who's running the shelter. Um, so as that firms up, we can definitely uh, bring that back here to let you all know what the plans around that would be and how it might impact the town, the neighborhood, um, anyone nearby. All right. Thank you. Yes. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Matt Perilla. I live on High Street. Um, I understand one of the original considerations for this property was to develop it with housing. And uh, I, we do have a homeless problem in town. We do have, or in the state, um, we do have a housing issue in the state and in town. And it seems to me that a more direct and reasonable approach for addressing the housing problem might be building more housing. And that could keep people from falling into homelessness. Um, obviously, homelessness is also a problem, but. Uh, you know, that would just be a nice, direct way to prevent some people from falling into this unfortunate situation. Totally agree. All right. Hands for Matt. All right. Thank you. Any comment? We need more housing units, yes. <laughs> Affordable housing in particular. It's part of the administration strategy, but this is the measure in between while we have, while we're building more housing units and hopefully encouraging that to happen, we're still going to have high levels of homelessness. We actually have like uh, the programs to move people into units. We have the money available to subsidize some of those folks who might need a helping hand to get into a unit, but we don't have the units to move them into. Um, so affordable housing is definitely a part of the overall strategy, but what we're talking about here is the short term temporary shelter in between that. Okay, Bob, Westcott. Hello, hello. Um, I was wondering, if, do you have any sense of what fraction of the 40 people that are gonna be in the shelter are our local friends and neighbors? Because if let's say 90% of them came within from within 10 miles of the shelter, I think the answer would be, hell yes, let's help our friends and neighbors, right? If they're all from Australia or whatever, then that's, that's, a, different, that's a different sales thing. And so, you know, there must be some homeless people that showed up from, that have been homeless from Waterbury. Right. We don't know. I mean, I, in all I, fairness, the folks at home may not have heard that short dialogue earlier, if you just want to okay. recap it. Yeah, I'll just say that we, we, um, we gather a certain amount of data on people. It's It's... It's imperfect. It, we rely on what they tell us. Um, I think you heard some folks in the room already say that your friends and neighbors are experiencing homelessness. Um, we, we all have those folks in our community. Um, but I'm not sure about this particular, like if we can go through all of the hotels in the 1,600 rooms that we have across the state and see who's from Waterbury um, and try to place them in those 40 beds here. But I think those folks should get priority if they have connections to the community and will probably be more likely to succeed here in those in those 40 beds. We would, um, we would definitely consider that as part of the placement process. All right, thanks. Bill Shepluck. Thank you. Bill Shepluck, and I hope this isn't political, but um, thank you. Uh, I'm the town health officer, and uh, just anecdotally, uh, two summers ago, I was uh, uh, a gentleman who delivers Meals on Wheels came into my office and told me about a woman who was living on Batchelder Street with no, no water in her apartment. I investigated a four-unit apartment just recently sold. The, the new landlord increased all the rents from $750 to $1,500 a month. Three apartments were empty. This one woman had nowhere to go. Um, she's, I don't know where she is now. 
this is a big problem. This is not a perfect solution. Uh, I think everyone here has already acknowledged that the timing of this is difficult. Uh, I'm glad I'm not sitting there anymore where Tom is because it's, it's challenging. But uh, as Teresa is here, and I know she supports this, um, it's interesting to me that the state is able to come up with however much they're paying for this National Guard armory. When they're sitting on Stanley and Watson Hall site over here, where three years ago we wrote a letter and asked Buildings and General Services to turn that property over to Down Street so they could build permanent housing. It's still sitting there doing nothing. So that's the solution that we need. I think we have to live with this. I think we have to encourage this to be temporary, but the, the permanent solution is to prevent the apartments across the street from having the landlord evicting people and doubling the rents and putting visiting or traveling nurses in those homes. That's what's happening right there across the street, and that's why people can't afford a place to live. Thank you. Answer Bill. All right. Thank you. Um, can I have you up here? Hmm? Ann, him off. <laughs> I have four minutes left. Okay. Uh, real quick, um, I, I, I was wondering if Chris knows how many uh, people are homeless in Washington County, um, aside from the Waterbury people, uh, are there any numbers? And the other thing I'd like to mention is uh, I don't know how many people uh, at the fire station or online lived here prior. I. Uh oh. Well, that's what we got from Ann. I think we got the general gist of what she was asking. Yeah, we we do have numbers on people by county. I'll say Washington County is third behind um, Chittenden and Rutland, um, and slightly ahead of um, Bennington and and Wyndham. Um, and we do have. So, I I don't I I support the concept of having temporary shelter for our friends. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. And we also know how many people are in the hotels in, in Washington County as well. I don't have those numbers right in front of me, but I can provide them. Okay. All right. Thanks. Sure. Sharon Dolly, resident of Waterbury, but I also am an owner of a licensed residential care facility. Um, and I think it's important for the community to know that six plus months ago, um, we were informed as a group of licensees about the specifics of the Jew cohort. And we were all surveyed and participated in the survey to what extent we would be willing to help with this crisis in specific to Act 81 in the June cohort. We all responded, and I haven't heard from one person, whether it be your agency or Dale, in regards to my response. So I am disturbed as a Waterbury community member knowing what I did and put my hand out to see if I could help, and they've done nothing. I just talked to Megan Tierney Ward on Friday. There's still all kinds of talk, but no nothing that involves us. So I'm sorry if that's a little bit out of the realm for the general population, um, but I want you all to know that there are some options, um, and the state has not, it's, again, not your department, but um, it's, I, I don't understand. It's my, it's my agency, so okay. we do have, we're doing a lot of interdepartmental works, with, so whether it's DCF or Corrections or Mental Health or Dale um, or the Department of Health uh, or even DIVA, like we need to do better than, than we have in working together and connecting. That Dale piece of it, I know the uh, Representative Wood is very much informed and interested in that and we're trying to pull that piece forward to help the people who are in there so, so I, I, clear, i'd love to connect with you ago, after i yep. said i have a bed available and not one person yeah, that's not okay. said let me talk to you because yep. there are a lot of people in the hotels and motel program who is, have significant needs who could use that level of care mm -hmm. is this just to clarify is this specific this armory shelter specific to the june cohort 
Um, yes, that is that okay. is the intention. So we're talking yep. about that 600 plus group of yep. with you five, 500 in the age category, 60 plus, yep. and 80, a little under 100 in the disability, disability category. Uh, I'm not certain on those numbers, but, but something it, like that. And there's yep. like eight pregnant. Yep. That is the group we're talking about. Yeah. So we're not talking about the general homelessness. Correct. And we're not talking about somebody calling 211. I don't have a place to sleep tonight. Correct. We're not talking about the general people that would qualify for the hotel motel program. We are focused on that June. The cohort. June cohort. Yep. Okay. Thank you for that. Thank you, Sharon. And hmm? yeah, uh, I do want to wind this up. Um, oh. Teresa, I don't know if you uh, had uh, anything to sure. to say to us, and uh, then we'll get the actually. The, yeah. Go ahead. She may be able to answer what I'm going to make a comment about. So all right. Well, why don't you make your comment, and then we'll ask Terry to come up. We've all heard a lot tonight about it's the cost of living in Vermont that's creating a lot of this homeless stuff. Mm -hmm. And that people can't afford apartments. The apartment, the apartment prices have gone up. Housing has gone way up. Yet we have a legislature, and maybe Teresa can help bring it in, that continue to pass bills that cost us all more which then adds to the homelessness. Yeah. So the, the, the vicious cycle has got to come to an end at some point. And maybe she can answer to that how we can stop passing all these bills to help people that don't have anything that costs the rest of us more that creates more people becoming homeless. Okay. Answer, Gary. Thank you, Teresa. This is made for taller people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have to make it adjustable. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everyone. It's nice to see um, so many people come out to share their thoughts and concerns online. I think they sort of broke the record. Um, uh, so my name is Teresa Wood. I'm state representative here in Waterbury. I'm as Sir Bolton Hills Board Huntington. And I am chair of the House Human Services Committee, a committee that deals with the uh, uh, individuals who are homeless and the supports and services needed to try to rectify that situation. Um, I have a lot of the same concerns that people have raised here tonight. Um, and in fact, I shared them with Commissioner Winters earlier today. Um, the state doesn't have a real good track record when they say something is temporary and um, and then, uh, you know, we can look at the Middlesex facility that's been there for 10 years and is now going to be there for another several years, but repurposed. Um, so I think that those concerns are valid and warranted. And um, I think that we need to uh, hold the state's feet to the fire on this. And um, I'm just going to be frank, and, and Chris has only been in this position a short time, but we have asked the administration for a plan for the homeless people for the last four years. Um, and what they are bringing forth is a plan to house people for 90 days. That's not a plan from my perspective, I will say. Um, we have not had a focus on unit development um, for very low income people. People who are living on SSI or SSDI, um, they're living uh, they're living with very low income. Um, not all of them, as, as Commissioner Winter said, we do have people in this, in this group of people who are um, working and have families and have been priced out of the market, essentially. So um, it, there is no one solution. That's the, that's the one thing that I can tell you. There's no one single solution. Um, and I think that the, the biggest thing that we can do is to try to um, have a period of time that essentially buys us some time until we have more units available for people at this income range. Um, I, I don't think, honestly, it's a very good plan <laughs> to have a three-month shelter. Um, you know, people have asked what comes next, and we don't really have a response about what comes next. Um, the, House, uh, the House passed the budget adjustment bill and it did include an additional, uh, the governor had asked for 8.2 million. The house added 2.5 million to that, reduced the amount being paid to hotel owners by, uh, to $75 a day from the 135 roughly. Um, and that, uh, that buys extra time until June 30th. 
for 1,500 households to be in the hotel motel program. And I always put program in quotes because it is really uh, just a, um, it, it's not a program. People do not get the kinds of supports that people would get in a shelter, in a bona fide shelter. And I think you've heard Commissioner Winters say that. Um, do we have enough shelter beds, bona fide shelters? Okay, I'm not talking about the hotel and motel. I'm talking about bona fide shelters where people receive assistance with um, transportation, with um, case management and referrals to substance use providers if they need that, mental health providers if they need that, um, job coaching, all, all of those things are part of the uh, construct of a professionally run shelter. Um, I have my doubts about whether you hire a profession and get that up and running and do that for three months and then you just stop it. Um, it, it honestly, it just doesn't, it makes zero sense. Um, it makes zero sense that the governor hasn't included any of that um, in his budget for FY25. Um, so, uh, I, you know, in my committee we try to make the best of trying to ferret out the facts and looking at the needs of people without putting people out on the street at the same time transitioning them. And we have reduced that cohort number um, significantly. Um, and, uh, you know, has it been perfect? Absolutely not. It has not been perfect. And um, Vermont, right along with the rest of the country, is undergoing this. And it's, it's actually not even <coughs> in the United States. This is a worldwide issue. Um, and it is, uh, it is part of the impact of coming out of the pandemic and what has happened since then. So um, I don't have, I don't have, you know, a lot of money in my pocket. I don't have a lot of solutions. Um, I think that uh, what we'll be doing in my committee is um, we'll be grilling the commissioner tomorrow. He'll be in my committee giving testimony on his budget um, on these, uh, these temporary shelters and a plan for the future. My committee is in the process of doing what we call a GA, which is General Assistance Emergency Housing um, uh, Modernization, uh, because the rules that have been in effect for this program really date back to its inception in the 60s and 70s, and they're not really as reflective of what today's uh, society is. Um, so that's all part of the work that my committee is doing um, around this. All right. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you, Commissioner Winters. Uh, it is 9.06. Uh, we're well over our allotted time. Appreciate everyone's patience and everyone coming out to participate. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Winters said, it's probably not the last time we're going to be talking about this issue. Sure. We can take a break for three minutes and stretch our legs. I apologize also to all of you online. Uh, it wasn't ideal. We're approximately 30 minutes behind schedule. It's not bad. I'll call us back to order and address uh, the next item on the agenda, which is finalized budget and warning for the annual meeting. Uh, Tom, can you help us? Uh, sure. I, I emailed Karen. I don't know if you can bring that up on the screen or I can pass it out. Where are we? Oh, oh, finalized budget. I probably have to do a screen. For warning. Yes, if Well, I hope the rest of this meeting is uneventful. Well, we, we cleared the room. You know, that's what people wanted to know about. People don't want to stay in here about the budget and stuff like that. <laughs> So the, the prior budget that was presented had a slightly higher tax increase, but since meeting with the select board, we... Got us. Okay. The prior budget presented had a slightly higher tax increase, but since meeting with the select board, we talked about the, a little bit of money we had in for sidewalks. That was $30,000 that came out. And then I didn't... I had in the budget a really healthy increase for the state police contract and I was hoping to get an exact final figure today I did not but I've got some assurances that my budget figure was too healthy okay. so I, I, I still have a 15% increase in that contract and essentially what I've been not officially told but unofficially told is they'll simply look at the last year and apply an, an inflator to that 
So 15% is still an awful lot of wiggle room. So that would that would bring us to a 2.4% uh, tax increase uh, as of Damn. today. So 1.3 pennies. Uh, I'm gonna let uh, Tom finish, and uh, then we'll call for comment. Okay. So we'd be we'd be 1.3 cents. Um, on the 2023 tax rate, a little under $40 for a $300,000 home, which is typical. I know people will say that's not typical of a home in Waterbury, but remember our common level of appraisal is below the market. Um, earlier, there was a proposal I had presented to use some of our reserves to pay down some debt early and reduce the tax rate. Um, I actually don't suggest doing that right now. Uh, in part, we're lower overall, and in part, we may need that to deal with some of what we heard of tonight mm -hmm. um, yes. to address some challenges that may arise. And so um, if you're comfortable at 2.4 percent, we, we can essentially wrap the budget up. Okay. <coughs> Comments from the board? Uh, I'll make a comment. I think all the, okay. all, all the work that you put in, Tom, to bring this budget in below 3% has not gone unnoticed. Thank you. If, if, you, if you could work on the state people to get their <laughs> money down. <laughs> well, yeah, the education. I that's, mean, that's the whole kicker. Yeah. We could do what we want, but it's not going to make a difference if the, if the education oh. is high. <coughs> Tom, are you suggesting you're pulling the thirty thousand and not repairing the sidewalk? There will be some sidewalk work, which will be which will be grant funded, that pays on pays for Park Row. But after talking about it further with with the board and Bill Woodruff, um, we'd like to do some sidewalks around the schools, especially over time. If we could wait and in a future year do a much larger bid, we'll get better better pricing per foot. I didn't know if you were going to then maybe considering not necessarily lowering your police department budget, but if it does in fact come in substantially lower, if you would take that surplus and maybe replace, <coughs> replace the 30000 for the sidewalk, but that doesn't sound like that's what you're thinking about. I think we're better served if we wait okay. and... and I don't have an exact number for you. I haven't gotten that level of detail from contractors. But if you, if we can bid out a quarter million dollars at a time, we'll get much better unit pricing. That's, I mean, you you know that business better than I do. Yeah. The other challenge we have is with with the sidewalk work we did this past year, for example, which was uh, Randall Street. Um, our staff pull the sidewalks, and. Public Works is looking forward to having those staff do some road work uh, this next summer. So there's a there's a cost saving to have them do the sidewalk, but there's plenty of work on our on our on our roads that can be done too. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are already under grant <coughs> contract are, are Park Row um, and Elm Street. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so, any other comments on the, from the board about the uh, budgeted 15% increase uh, on the uh, state police contract? <coughs> no. Okay. We're all comfortable with that. I guess uh, then the next point is to... Yes, Mike. On the special articles, I know as of the last meeting, didn't Green Mountain Transit not give us a accounting and report? Have they since done so? Um, they potentially, no, I think I have a report. And a, well, they are one of the few that use their um, request as their report. So some, some, some okay. of the people send in a report, an invoice, and right. an appropriations request. And then there's a few, such as Green Mountain Transit, that they just use their request as their report. So there's a request in the top, at my recollection, and then language underneath that speaks to their ridership and things of that nature. Um, so I do think I have I have So they have met your now, because I know as of they last. They haven't sent me an invoice for 2023. Right. Yeah. So we still haven't paid that. <laughs> 
What, what do we do at, at some point? We just say we're not going to pay for, for the last year. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I've, I've certainly never been faced with that issue. They don't invoice because I know we've had this question before. If they don't invoice, I would just assume not pay. I don't think we do pay if they don't invoice. Yeah, they right. have to invoice. <laughs> right, that's what I'm saying. Um, but if, and I'm not necessarily jumping through hoops to ask again. Right, you've, you've asked, asked I don't know how many and, times. Yeah, so. different, different towns have different procedures. Some towns take the position that because the voters specifically approve the article, no invoice is required and simply if, if, no, if an invoice is received, they'll honor it. But if none is received by the end of the year, they'll simply make the payment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. I know history has been we've had invoices. Yeah, I have and an invoice. The town clerk has always requested one. Yes, so I, I do feel a little, you know, I don't think it's asking too much for an invoice. Mm -hmm. But I, I appreciate what you're saying, how other people do it. Gary. Should not the same rules be applied to these groups in invoicing as they are, uh, like, departments within the municipality. Like, I have so much time to submit an invoice that will be accounted for in 2023, as an example. And if I have a purchase order, it can go a little bit longer. But then then, then there's a hard cutoff, and nothing can be paid out of 23, so it comes out of 24. Mm. And I think we've gone past that date. Maybe we just, sorry, you didn't put it in. Uh, how does it work from uh, your accounting perspective? Until the books are completely closed and audited, we can always date an invoice back. Yeah, right. Tom would have to sign it at this point to get it back for 2023. And when, when would that audit happen? Um, we probably have a few months, maybe three or four months in reality. I'll just be on the record. I wouldn't pay them. Because it's just like we've had this argument about delinquent taxpayers, that you miss the date, you're done. And if, if we hold our town taxpayers to that standard, I don't know why these special articles, folks, it's not that hard to send an invoice. And I'm would you just, care to uh, make a motion? I, I would make a motion. What, what would be, what's the deadline for, what, what's the deadline? Maybe it the, sounds the like the, is the audit, I guess. Yeah. For the audit, I don't think that doesn't April sound. first. I'll make a motion. Uh, okay, we got a motion over here. I move that the Waterbury Select Board, after town meeting, create a policy that is then emailed with all of the recipients from this year's annual meeting, setting out the terms of payment required based on the outcome of town meeting. I know we normally wait 30 days for the appeal, so I just think. I don't dispute the fact that we need a standardized policy that we should encourage folks to pay on specific terms. I feel at this point, retroactively, it seems like this is an outlier. I'm not disputing that there's merit to saying they can't be paid, but I think given that our agenda item for this evening is to finalize the warning for our annual town meeting this year, which has a number of special articles, I would propose that we look to finalize said warning and that when folks are notified of the town meeting outcome, it is with clear payment provision terms moving into the 2024 fiscal year. I second the motion. Right. Karen, would you mind reading that back? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Alyssa. Oh, yeah. no, the I was, was, was going. I, I think the, mid, the middle part was uh, informational. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, there's no policy about payment de invoice deadlines. There's no policy, but she already does send out Correct. you approved and you need to send us an invoice. Mm -hmm. Yep, so we're setting a deadline and a policy for payment provisions if we approve that motion. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Motion passes. And so now are we on to the warning? On to yeah. the warning itself. Yeah. I'm unfortunately, realizing in this moment of all the things I did today, mm -hmm. I did not print one of these that doesn't say draft. Ooh. Yeah, like, so we can't oh, sign no, it. So we can't sign it. We can sign it. So, um, we'll sign the draft and then. Uh, oh, yeah, you can't sign the draft. So you can't take the mark off. Okay. Um, 
You can, can approve fire, it tonight. Verbally. Can our fire chief print one if you email I'm him now? I can't get into my files. <laughs> Whatever. Like, we'll all come nothing in. is going to go well. We'll all come into the office. Yeah, we yeah. can come. I yeah. can swing by the office in the morning. I can swing, swing by the office tomorrow morning. If you can get to it, we can go downstairs. Yeah, downstairs. I can't seem to get in the network. Yeah. Yeah. Can we all swing by in all the morning? Right. But yes. we can. If, uh, if everybody could just sign it, we'll date it for tomorrow instead of tonight. If, yeah. If, if I can ask. Do we need a motion for that? Too. Yeah, not a problem. No. Just okay, thank you. Yeah. I've all right. been working on that, but I can't get that. Do I have uh, any further discussion on uh, the warning? I'm just confirming that we support <coughs> Article 21. Yeah. The last well, yeah, Article 21 is the one I was looking at as well. Yes. <laughs> and I just wanted to make a note of that. Um, when it comes to ar writing articles like this, there's no exact guidance you'll find. Different attorneys have different interpretations. Some attorneys will say estimated to total $30,000. Some attorneys will say, no, you should say up to $30,000. Mm. Um, it's select board choice. So this is estimated to total $30,000. And as of today, the claim is for $33,000. But um, hmm. so that is interesting. <laughs> FEMA has a history of massaging claims along the way. So uh, there's an yeah. automatic buffer built in uh, based on that. And bottom line is that we are kind of doing this for the <coughs> purpose of transparency, not legality. So yeah, should $33,000 come in, it's still quite well within legality, <coughs> et cetera, to you, put the funds where they're meant to go. You, right? you have the authority to, to right. transfer funds to crew without voter approval. Right. Okay. So are we happy with the way it's written? I think the intent is clear enough. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yes. Okay. Any other issues that uh, people would like to bring before the board? Do I have a motion? I move to accept the draft warning as written. Is that what the motion you're looking for? Exactly. Dated okay. January 30th. Dated January 30th. <laughs> <laughs> the last second? Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Just a note uh, on Karen's, under Karen's signature, it should reflect the date change. Yeah, there's two places. Oh, uh, yes, two places. That's okay. Yeah. All right. As well as the pocket box. All in favor of the motion with uh, the uh, friendly amendment from uh, Mr. Bard, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The warning is approved. <coughs> Next on the agenda is tax payment options. I can speak to that. All right. Desire. I guess the first thing I'll say is um, I'm reasonably confident that this will be brought up uh, from the floor during town meeting day, and that at least one person will suggest that 8% is too high uh, for what that's worth. Um, did some additional thinking and research about this, and there's two items that we suggested, I suggest, are, are reasonable to consider. And the first is um, the tax due date, we simply stay open later. Mm -hmm. Staff are here a little while after that, after our normal close anyway, because it takes time to, to balance all the deposits and process it. So if we're open, you know, I think this past year they let. Thank you. <laughs> I think this past year they left Thank around 5.15 or 5.30. So if, if we stay open that extra hour or so and, and there's a few additional people that come in, it's not going to keep them there until 7.30. So, I so think you're that's suggesting 5.30? I think 5.30 is a reasonable ask. Mm -hmm. um, gives, gives people a little more time just in case. The other piece is we do allow ACH payments. We encourage it. A lot of people take advantage of it. You have to sign up in advance. There's online options. We'd have to find a vendor um, where you can pay. They call it e-check often, but it's essentially an ACH payment from your bank account to ours that you initiate online. Um, Stowe allows that, and I believe the payment is a, is a dollar fifty. You that's can pay the fee for that's the, the fee. For, that's the fee for the service. You can pay your tax bill online via credit card, and there is a three percent charge that we don't get. That's the processing fee. So. 
three percent of your tax bill can be an awful lot of money. A buck fifty is not much. So, I think we research vendors and and identify this extra option. No sense in enriching the credit card companies. And I think those two things um, won't hurt. Mm -hmm. the, the problem's never going to go away, um, but I think these two things are pretty reasonable to do. Yes. Um, so I did speak to our vendor today, as indicated in the email. Um, E-checks, which even our vendor considers old technology, <laughs> are not secured funds. So that means if somebody uses an e-check on the platform and does it right, because he said a lot of times they don't fill it out correctly, um, a credit union has 21 days to pay it, a bank has three days, a user has 60 days to put a stop payment on it, um, if it's a personal check and three days as a business check. I don't love it. I think nowadays people can go on their bank account, they can use a bill pay service that's a bank check, it comes with secured funds, we know it's not going to bounce. <coughs> and that's a newer and more secure technology than e-checks. And our vendor does it for a dollar, opposed to a dollar fifty. So you can get a guaranteed uh, bank check for a dollar? No. You no, in that exercise, Roger, the individual paying their taxes is driving the payment. They're going on to their bank account and yep. they're saying, I want you to send the town of Waterbury a check for $2,500. Mm -hmm. But they have to do it 10 days in advance. Oh, okay. An e-check, yes, would allow them to do it day of, but it's not guaranteed to the town. The money's not guaranteed to be received. Mm -hmm. And when there's a 21-day lapse in, that, in the receiving of that money, it could be... Well, it certainly could be the next month. Mm -hmm. And then if there's a 60-day stop payment on it and the <coughs> tax due date is in November, now we're into the next year when we find out that the check has a stop payment. So the vendor talked me into a state of this isn't a great option. This is, this, there's a lot of other options out there that exist that aren't e-checks. So I, I don't like it. Aaron, just, Mike. just a question. From my banking background, I don't understand why a credit union has a 21-day leeway. Oh. I, to me, that, to me, it should be a, a, a three-day right of precision. But well, like me, the vendor call pointed out to me today, you go into the bank now and you open a checking account. They give you a debit card. They don't even give you checks anymore. Right. And you need your checking account and your routing number to right. even use an uh -huh. e-check. And, and you have to buy checks to get a check so you have that information. He's like, it's old technology. It's not being utilized. I guess I'm old school. Guess so. Um, uh, what, what happens if you get a check that that does bounce? Are you are you asking me yeah. process wise? Yeah. yeah. So um, I get an email from the bank that says that a check is bounced. Um, Northfield Savings Bank is great about getting me the information about who wrote the check quickly. Um, a memo has to be written to the bookkeeper to reverse the payment on the account and then add a $20 bounce check fee. And if they miss the deadline, then penalty and interest is added. And that process is the same for the town or EFUD. Okay. But why would the e-check be kind of any different effect than if someone <laughs> gave us a paper check that bounced? It, essentially, it isn't. Say it would it's be not, the same. No, essentially, it's no it isn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, it's really, I hear two, uh, two different measures being proposed. One is keeping the town office open until 5.30, uh, with the, based on the fact that the, the staff is uh, still there anyways, uh, processing the last minute uh, deposits. Uh, everyone feel okay about that? Do we? Yeah. yeah, I think leaving the town office open the extra hours would have saved me the penalty. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay with the town clerk? I won't be there. I'm not the tax collector. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good to know. Uh, do we have a, 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 a motion? I make, I make a motion to, on the day of tax collection, that the town offices stay open till 5.30 p.m. <laughs> But well, we'll have to have that motion on town meeting day yeah, because it's say. made. Oh, 
it's made as part of right, the warning. Right, as part of yeah. the whole collection. But. Okay. All right. Could I make it as a suggestion for it to be at town meeting? <laughs> I'll call on you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. I like, I like to collect money. All right. Any further discussion on the e-check issue? Uh, so are we not going the e-check issue then? I mean, it sounds as though uh, the, the vendor... Uh, says that it's a technology that has uh, significant loopholes. Uh, our town clerk has just uh, verified that. Um, and I'm not sure that it's going to solve any particular problems. Yeah, I think the only problem it would solve is um, allowing a day of option. Let's say somebody works in Burlington. They screwed up. They forgot. They're not going to get here. It allows a day of option without a 3% fee. Yeah, so yeah. it's just a, it's a more affordable day of option. But it doesn't <coughs> sound... I think it, I think it'd be helpful to know if other towns use it and if they struggle with it. If it's the same amount of bounce checks, written checks versus e-checks, I think we're a little late to be able to gather that information. Um, so if other towns use it really successfully, it could be worth a one-time trial and then say, "Wow, wrong move." Um, but I think we're too late to make a really strong case for that. So it might be something to be bring up in the future with more due diligence. I think few people know about e-checks. Can I mean, I, I use them. Can I make a suggestion about something? I think it's a very, very minority. This occurred to me tonight on the way home. Um, one thing that I have not done to, to push, and I don't think we've done to push as a town for a while, is the idea that you can just pay early on your taxes. You can pay monthly. Mm -hmm. You can pay weekly. You don't have to wait until the bill is due. <laughs> Um, there's about that. four, I think there's four people that do that. <laughs> I mean, it's a yeah. huge percentage. Um, but, um, but that's something that we can advocate for just to... Oh, like pay, like pay your bill monthly and then right. see how many people... Well, if it's, a, if it's the hardship of paying all at once, all at once or if it's a hardship of... Um, there's a lot of people who like to pay their taxes on the very last day, and those are the people who are getting penalties and interest for paying late. <laughs> not because they didn't have the money. Um, but there are individuals in our community who set up a bill pay service on their, on their online banking, mm -hmm. and the town just receives a check every month mm. for $100, sometimes it's $700. Um, and if they do that diligently, then at the very least, their penalty is reduced well, yeah. because their principal balance <laughs> is lower. So mm -hmm. uh, that's something that could be considered. Yes. Yeah. Um, to, to Danny's point, I think all of this is really administrative. None of none of how we pay goes into the one I mean, goes into the article at town meeting. So there's plenty of time between now and August to think about whether you pay is a good thing or a bad thing. Pushing ACH. I mean, that's the easiest way to pay on the last day is to sign up for ACH. And then it's on the town. The town's just the last day. Well done. Mm -hmm. um, but all of this, other things, I, I think you don't have to decide that tonight. I would caution you, however, that no matter how many options you try to give people to make, you know, to meet everyone where they're at, there's going to be people who are late, and there's going to be people who are mad, and it doesn't matter if it's going to be 8% or 4%, they're going to be upset. And, I, if you can find a way to solve that. Oh, I don't think we're trying to s eliminate the problem. I think we're trying to reduce it. I yeah. So we understand, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Bill. <coughs> All right. So just to be clear, the warning, all I'm doing is updating the dates, <coughs> excuse me, and removing the draft. Yes. Okay. So but we can, uh, Mike has already offered to bring up the uh, issue of uh, making a, a statement about uh, keeping the uh, town open from uh, tax day until 5.30 at the town meeting. Um, next on the agenda is uh, any other on tax options? We done? We're done. Okay. Uh, next meeting agenda, February 5th. And then we have to also decide if we're going to meet on the 19th, oh. which is, well, I did say we were, but uh, I, I believe in democracy, so uh, we're going <laughs> to put it to the board. Okay. Yeah, it is President's Day. That's the reason for 
the issue, but. <laughs> Town hall is open. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't sound like a municipal holiday to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, my calendar. Okay. So we have the uh, draft agenda in front of us. Um, an entertainment per permit for good fire. Uh, <clears throat> we've asked Revitalizing Waterbury to do a presentation on uh, upcoming issues and, and their budget, um, which we'll already have uh, proposed. Um, <coughs> and Karen has asked to go first, so that's essentially first. Um, and then the Housing Task Force uh, objectives, uh, Joe Camerata has asked to come back and present those. Um, and then at 8 o'clock, we've got the planning and DRB boards uh, to discuss the proposed changes in the phase one uh, zoning regs. Any other surprise state developments that we should be made aware of? I think perhaps there should be a placeholder on the agenda. Yes. Uh, Why? Why? Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, we may solve that before then, but. Oh, okay, good. But it wouldn't hurt to edit. Yep, understood. In the spirit of tonight and in the spirit of flood stuff that we did previously, I would propose we have armory development updates first on the agenda and just address with a more stringent time requirement what new developments we have. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Thanks, Leslie. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, so you want that first? I mean, after public would be my proposal. Yeah, I think so, right after public. Hopefully and it we won't can go just, forever. You know, depending on the level of updates, why I said it came to flood, it may be that there hasn't been significant updates since the last meeting. We're still in the wait and see phase, but I think given the attendance tonight, we need to provide the Knowledge updates it. that we have mm -hmm. and also discuss, like, if we need a venue for further feedback or email. I mean, we all have email inboxes. We're receiving <laughs> feedback, but if um, there needs to be a nor more formalized structure or anything like that, I just think that it wouldn't be in good faith after tonight to not have that first on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And uh, Danny, you are going to get back to us about the uh, February 10th. Uh, yeah, event. yes. And I sent just an email perhaps today to you, Roger. So uh, no, understood if you did not see it. Let me open that now. Um, so I, things going do you on. want that now or do you want that on the. N uh, if you could just give us like a short update uh, right now, what's being proposed, and then we can decide whether we need to put it on the agenda. Absolutely. So, Katarina said there's not so much an agenda as there's like a general overall plan. Starting at 6 is the event, and then right around 6.10 or 6.15. And this is for the community flood, just for those, because we've mm. just kind of spoken in code. Uh, the Where? community flood celebration. Yeah, where's what's it going to be? What's the flood, right? What, yeah, yeah what what's the, floods? the flood? That's at the um, Legion. To the Legion. Right. Um, and uh, around 6.10 or 6.15, a really short speaking program right now. Roger, you're uh, a maybe if you're interested. Tom. I've already agreed to do it. Oh, perfect. Okay. Tom, Liz, <laughs> Alyssa. It's at 6. Uh, yeah. And it starts at 6, and then around 10 or 15 minutes after that would be a short program, maybe 15 minutes. Um, just an acknowledgment of thanks and appreciation to the community. Um, and then right around 6.30 or so, music, dancing you know, whatever, pretty low key. The goal is celebration. And this is what I haven't spoken with Alyssa about is that there was conversation in some of the planning meetings of like paper plate awards, which is a very informal thing that's often done at community events, school events where, you know, you write an award. But um, I wrote back to um, Katarina asking like if there was more talk on that because I think I'd love to see that list. I think you'd love to see that list. Make sure if there is a list of folks being acknowledged individually, we'd want to take a look and yeah. add some names. Make so sure we didn't that's the only out significant omissions. Right. That's the only outstanding piece. But it's it seems to be pretty informal. Really, it's about community gathering, appreciation, and celebration. Okay. And uh, just curious, how are people being invited to this? Um, you know. So Open invitation. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's anyone who helped or was impacted floor. by the flood, which is pretty much all residents of Waterbury. So I think there was a post by Katarina on Front Porch Forum. I assume yeah. there'll be more. There's been invitations on Facebook that went out through the town but have been being spread by volunteers, et cetera. So there'll be another post, post I assume, on Front Porch Forum, and I can confirm that with Katarina. 
Um, and two <coughs> other specific venues are the list of all the volunteer folks who signed up on Summer oh, yeah, Genius or we know volunteered. We'll get a really specific, I'll say candidly, in the planning, the capacity of the Legion is 120 people, and it's one of those events we're not requiring RSVPs. We want it to just be accessible, but it's hard to balance between wanting it to be open and invited to everyone and recognizing we don't have unlimited space. <laughs> so it, just to say it's been in planning conversations a candid balance between those, but I would say like the volunteer email list and the impacted property owner email list, both of which we have very clearly, we'll probably get more in <coughs> email invite and then general public invite. Um, Liz Schlegel did reach out to Sarah Lee Tara about a poster. So there will be some, I think, general, you know, postering, front porch form kind of things, but then most specific targeted invite to folks on those email lists. Um, and on the paper plates, just say, I said I would help with that and haven't thought of further than what Danny described, but just say, I think circulating a list ahead of time um, could work out. And the intention is also that it would allow folks attending who maybe had a volunteer helper that they really want to thank a way to plug in because it isn't something super formal ahead of time. Yeah. That's fun. Great. All righty. And I think oh, we have yeah, a planning meeting Wednesday, just to say with Kevin. I don't think we need to put it on the agenda for okay. next week, from what I'm hearing. Yeah. No. Um, can I propose one modification? I would just say Please. if planning and DRB boards are coming for the purpose of discussing the unified development bylaw updates, that we tweak that language just to reflect mm -hmm. planning commission update on zoning rewrite or something similar, just in terms of public awareness of what we're planning to discuss. And this is a draft, so I put placeholders in opposed to the, like. Oh, totally. The sorry, that was mine. Yeah. There. So Unified. you would like it to say what? Well, Roger, Roger, I didn't. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm asking for clarification. Yeah, it's what? a discussion of the Unified uh, Bylaw updates. <laughs> Planning Commission presentation of the Unified Bylaw updates. Yeah, I, th I think it makes more sense to have the Planning Commission present and then have the select board and the DRB present to uh, ask questions, get clarification. Uh, if there's things that we disagree with, uh, we can try to iron those out. Uh, my whole point is to try to get the three different uh, municipal bodies to agree on the basic uh, elements of what we're presenting at the uh, public meetings, which will be uh, later on, I believe, in March. Yeah. Can I ask uh, another clerical? Or a, uh, please do. Okay. So it's perhaps what I heard you say then is the item on the agenda is Planning Commission Unified Bylaw Updates, but you want me to make sure that I include an invitation to the DRB to attend the meeting. Correct. Mm -hmm. Big mm -hmm. thumbs up. Yeah. Um, they will. But they won't actually be presenting. Their, their no, they'll be there for clarification and discussion of certain points. And do they know already that that's what they're... That was going to be my next question. <laughs> Who's... Uh, Mike, are you uh, the can liaison? Speak. Can you make sure I that they speak. get invited? Yep. Okay. All right. And I'll make sure that when I send the agenda, I include them on the, on the agenda. Oh, I'll make sure. All right. Any other comments on next agenda? What about February One. 19th? Oh, yeah, February 19th. Uh, I'm proposing that we hold a regular uh, Monday night meeting. It is President's Day. Um, it's not a municipal holiday, so I understand it. Um, but uh, uh, anyone, everyone okay with that? Yeah, all yeah. that's going on with this potential, you know, the congregate housing thing, you know, you never know. We might, we might have some more spillover. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll ask Karen to start drafting the, the thing, and uh, I expect that that will yep. be there. Um, we also may have some uh, updates uh, on the flood mitigation, um, and that is, I guess, one other issue that has come up is uh, whether we should uh, hold a, uh, some people have called it a flood fair, um, informational session on what's happening with the uh, natural uh, 
disaster uh, preparedness committee, uh, the crew, mitigation, updates from FEMA, elevation, and that sort of thing. What's your feeling? Uh, we'll start I with think Mike. That's, that's a great idea. Okay, who wants to, who wants to do it? <laughs> well, just one more thing. Um, I don't know if it doesn't, net, it's not so time sensitive, but Al Lewis, he's a Rotarian, he's chair of the Rotary Parks Committee. Uh, Tom probably, I think he got a copy of in, in, information. Basically, the rules and regulations for the parks, once the village got, you know, nuked, uh, there are really well, no. They, they did themselves in. Well, so. <laughs> there are there are, there are, there are no really rules and regulations in effect. So he's looking for the town to, Adopt. you know, draft some. And I don't know if how we want to do this. We can I can work on that with Al. We have a parks ordinance, so there's right some rules in place. Yeah. Right. I think they would feel comfortable because with all the events that they wind up holding. I don't think it would be something difficult, but it probably should become before us to approve. I'm sure we can find the old one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would probably be very similar to that. Would you, are you going to see Al tomorrow? Uh, yeah. In the, if, if he's at the Rotary meeting, I right. don't know. Just uh, let him know that uh, Winterfest uh, will be uh, at the... Uh, Rusty Parker Park on Saturday, and uh, we might be tapping into uh, the uh, electrical outlet if it's alive. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I, I think he's got my number. Shoot. What? Winterfest. Did we do that last week? Or is that Sh on my consent Speaking agenda? of Winterfest, oh, right. what, was, what, what, was there? I heard way back two when two there was a. Agenda. There was a rumor that we were going to be doing some sort of event on game show night. The select board came together. Yeah, that that's closed out. So I saw it was filled. I think he got it to me on time, so we didn't. I didn't know if one of those crazy names was us. You better check. I don't think so. I think we're too late to get it. I'm looking now. Okay. Yeah, your pastor was on last And just a just a quick update. Brian Voigt with Central Vermont Regional Planning was here a while back. We talked about a grant application. We submitted the grant to State Emergency Management, which is the first layer of approval, and they recommended it to FEMA for funding. So we're hopeful that at some point relatively great. soon we'll we'll have that award. Mm, no, awesome. That's great. Hey, and we just yeah. lost uh, um, Perfect timing. So tomorrow morning we can sign off on that? Um, well, no, we if you, do, can we approve I, it now? Yeah, just to prove it now. I apologize, I don't have the details. Oh, I know my backwards. Um, yeah. Warren, we'll do you want me to know. sign those in the morning? Uh, oh, yes, one yes, more agenda yes. before uh, Sorry. before we adjourn. Yeah, I think it would be good. It's um, it's basically Mark Fryer. Oh no. Yeah. And it wasn't on tonight's agenda then. Special Events Permit Bakersfield LLC Cabot Cheese. No, that's not it. Yeah, Mark no. Fryer put in a Special Events Permit for WYC, I think is the name of his entity, to serve in the gazebo, right. I believe, um, for a Winterfest event this Saturday. Mm -hmm. So I guess if, in the absence of finding it on any of these darn agendas, if somebody can make it. It's a beer tasting. It'll take place from 2.30 to 4 o'clock. Uh, I thought that was a pro pig. Uh, uh, no, Mark, this no. is Fryer uh, is doing it uh, on behalf of uh, the beer shepherd, Vermont Beer Shepherd. But Fryer holds the license, and he's asking for a tasting permit. Taking him at the Rotary tomorrow, Beer Shepherd. Mm -hmm. So I'll entertain a motion. Uh, I move to grant Mark Fryer and WYC a permit to do a beer tasting at the gazebo. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> we got the permit. And then um, final note, um, 36 Union Street, which you approved for a buyout a long time ago, finally got the paperwork back. Oh, great. So you all need to sign this, or at least three of you need to sign it and notorize it. Which Karen you can do had, tomorrow. Which you can do yeah. tomorrow. So I'm going to just give it all to so Karen. We're going to have a whole packet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. the blank one. Okay. Awesome. Lot. Get our pens ready. I brought my stuff. And 40 Union has all been given to FEMA, and it's in the... 
you know, it's in the, the meat grinder of that process, and we'll find out. So more both information the houses on each side of, of Terry <coughs> are at almost complete with their applications? Yes. He's going to have a lot of room to run around. Mm -hmm. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Move and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.